Good. Oh. Good evening. That's weird. Be right back. <laughs> No, it's just, it's not the cats. Good evening, for real this time. I reorganized things a bit, so I don't think that was attached to that issue though, but it did make things a little bit worrisome to like, wait, is it, is it this? No, it's not, probably. It's just another small issue. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, thank you, Octorit, for 17 months. Welcome back to the garden. It's coming up on two years nearly. And you say an evening primrose will be the first flower plant on Earth, too? I hate to inform you, I am pretty certain the first thing is probably going to end up growing. <laughs> I'm trying to think, okay, initially it's kind of a something that's easy to grow, that, that's like a weed. And then it's kind of a, wait... You know what? Hmm. Something that would probably be easy to deal with might actually be like a Venus flytrap or something like that. Some sort of meat-eating creature. <laughs> Don't care about soil quality as long as they can get their mouth around something. And flies will probably be another easy thing to cultivate, whether or not they want to. <laughs> so it might be something a bit more like that, maybe. That's Sue. The maggot farms. The maggot farms. I like Blade Runner. I like Blade Runner. I think it's probably more so moisture is going to be an issue. It'll be more of a desert plant. Then again, evening primroses don't do poorly in that sort of environment. But generally not known for eating, for being a carnivorous plant. They're not. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, uh, so I did some reorganization of stuff, so I'm going to be looking probably a little bit in different spaces than normal. <laughs> I still haven't figured out exactly how I want this to work. It's kind of a, huh, maybe I should adjust that. Maybe I should adjust this. <sighs> I, I bit the bullet and I went with a dual monitor uh, arm. So I have a lot of, it's kind of so much room for activities now, except for the fact that I also cleared off a bunch of other stuff. Like um, a lot of things that I was do doing with the capture card are no longer here, but their holder has not arrived yet. And a few other things that are taking up space. But no more, no more weird stands. No more weird stands. Also, new mouse, so no more weird clicky problems. I'll just have regular double clicking problems. It'll, it'll, I'll be mental blocks and not physical blocks. <laughs> and actually, I was looking at an Ava mouse pad, not mouse pad, Ava mouse. And I said, no, I don't need a mouse that is more f form over function. And then I saw the movie today. It's kind of a shh. Sh I should have got it. I should have got it. I should have gotten the Alaska mouse. I should have got it. But no. No, I'm stuck with a regular one. Yeah. Microwave? No. I, um... I haven't done that yet. I haven't done that yet. I haven't hired anyone for that yet. 
uh, learns that for task rabbit that you have to put in the details for the job first. Um, then I guess people like bid on it or something. I've learned to accept that damage from the cats is something that's going to happen to almost everything that I love and hold dear. And honestly, a little bit of Komari, like it's better for it to be used and loved and maybe even potentially damaged during that than for it to stay pristine in the box forever. <laughs> it's better for it to be used for its desired or intended purpose. Collectors hate this. <laughs> Collectors hate this one concept. And honestly, yeah, it does kind of like kill any after collector aftermarket. <laughs> I guess except the Japanese one where it's like, oh, this is a B because the box is damaged. And it's kind of a, but everything else is perfect, right? <laughs> everything else is fine. <sighs> Japanese used market is crazy. Everything is usually in such good condition. Um, might depend on like what kind of collector you are. Because there are people who keep things like mint in box or something like that. Uh, and then like for whatever reason, they end up selling it right later down the line. Uh, I'm trying to think, like, I can imagine that some people might have, especially some backups of things. I'm trying to think. Hmm. Hmm. I swear that there's something in my mind about that, but I don't remember. A thought of later reselling? Hmm. All I can think of is Beanie Babies. <laughs> beanie Babies. People put them in their nice little plastic boxes that were especially made for holding Beanie Babies to show off their collection. And maybe one day in 20 years, they will be worth something. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, I got to make some room, so I... I also, I kind of refound something that um, I kind of forgot that I had, which is a cover for the iPad, so I can, I can cover it when it's not in use, so it's not constantly visible. Uh, and theoretically, also stand it up, but I don't know if I can stand it and draw at the same time. But I also got a cord, so it's not a really awkward there. <laughs> I don't. I I got the tablet ready just because I'm not entirely certain what this is going to end up being like because this is blind for me too i meant to read it beforehand but i didn't so it's just blind we're gonna experience this together dm to dm i guess <laughs> or potential dm to potential dm <laughs> i don't know if i'm ever gonna run this because again like sci-fi is not really my bag but at the same time this is not this is not nasa i'm gonna say nasa i'm gonna say nasa at some point it's nasa uh it's nasa doing a D&D &D adventure, so it's kind of a... I don't super know what to expect. I also know that some other people have covered this. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to check out their streams afterwards. Uh, yeah. well, let's see. Also, one of my... Nope. No, so you know it keeps falling down and I just need to actually deal with the thing instead of re-sticking it. Because it's not a permanent one. I say permanent as in... <sighs> Some of these are probably going to be sticking around for a long time. Other ones I can mark off as I do them. Like, remove them as I do them. Let's see, let's see. I'm going to have to move over for this. <laughs> the Lost Universe. Also, if I'm too low compared to normal, let me know because I have to... I moved things around. <laughs> I moved things around. I'm still getting used to like, where do I, where do I sit? Where do I look? Posture check. I was just fixing that. 
I was just fixing. I am. I, I was just fixing that, like right before you redeemed it. Mm. Okay, that cracked. I was. I was. Because again, like trying to figure out. Okay, this is over here. That's over there. Where is my center? Where is the center? This is the center. I think this is the center. So I should actually be over here. Which kind of puts other things off a little bit. Hold on. Wait. Oh no. Oh no. Okay. Uh, I did do some of this testing, but it's just also the natural sh- I understand now. It's the floor. The ground is uneven. So... Okay. This is gonna get something. <laughs> I mean, this this place has had a long time to settle. It's not as old as me. But it's it's not an it's not a young house. <laughs> this house should have a pen this house's pension has run out. <laughs> Celsus pension has run out. Okay. Actually, I might just have to... Eh. Maybe if I do this. There we go. Maybe. Or if I do this. Eh, 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 eh. <laughs> okay. Everything's fine. I just made one small... Error. I cost myself my cute little display that I suppose can be no more because if I touch anything, it's going to fall over. <laughs> I can't. I can't put an acrylic stand on top of the monitor just in case I touch the monitor. And I should twist that, but I don't know if I can do that now. I might twist something. Not myself. Uh, something else. Wait. Ah. Um. I actually kind of hate that. I'm going to twist back. Uh. Okay. This might be better. Although it might also be worse. Okay. Now, where was this? Ah. Ah. Oh no, it's sagging. Oh no, it's sagging. Uh, uh. Oh. Okay, I think it's where it was before. Um. I'm sorry, my I apparently have. I haven't balanced things properly. I haven't balanced things properly. Oh no, I twisted it again. And it's just... Uh, okay. Uh, nothing feels straight anymore. Nothing feels straight anymore. <sighs> okay. You know that feeling? You thought you were fixing it, but then you just made it worse. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 when I got this, the new monitor arms thing, I, I got it and it was kind of, a, I'm going to do it right now. Even though I've had two, two ciders, I'm going to do it. And like three or four hours later, I finished. And I'm still not, I, I'm happy with the arms. I just haven't figured out like my my optimal setup for everything yet. I guess I haven't tweaked enough. No, you'll straight. The internet does does strange things, huh? The internet bends things. Okay, I'm actually gonna move a little bit more over. Here we go. Hmm. Hmm. 
losing a telescope to a dragon. I don't know if the dragon, how involved the dragon is. So NASA's tabletop role-playing game adventure. A lost space telescope, missing researchers, and a rogue planet. Are you up for the challenge? Huh. The trees are breaking in the middle? That's kind of strange. And the moon in the distance. So it's 43 pages we'll, we'll try and get through. I mean, a lot of those appendixes. Oh, it's actually linked. That's nice. That's, that's a nice quality of life touch. Oh, I just realized something. Because this is put out by a government agency, it has to be 508 compliant. And that might be partly why it is linked. And also that probably means that things have good alt text. This is actually probably going to be a really good adventure in that aspect. Uh, I got posture checked six minutes ago. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Legally mandated quality. I believe they have to have alt text. Um, they, when there's charts and stuff, you need to have it organized in a certain way. Uh, let's see. So, like, if it's screen red, it's not the worst. A real life picture is a detailed image of the telescope. The telescope might be the hard part, honestly. Okay. Welcome, adventurers. You enter now into the world of Ex Exlaris. Exlaris? You enter now into the world of Exlaris, where science and magic meet. This is a world not unlike Earth, yet on a very different path. Exlaris is a solo wanderer through the cosmos. A rogue planet. Also, you will note that they never actually say this is for D&D. It's just for... They might say, oh, it's compatible with your favorite... But compatible with your favorite role-playing game? I believe that's the tagline here. Uh, for your preferred tabletop role-playing game system. Easily adaptable. <laughs> As I like design for party of four, four to seven, level seven to ten. Yeah, yeah, because everything follows that same kind of pathway, huh? Yes, I'm just going to grab four. <laughs> I'm going to grab four people who are playing uh, Worlds Without or yeah, Worlds Without Number. At level 7. Or level 10. Hint, hint. I think like 10 is the maximum you can go. <laughs> this game has two parts that can be completed, or can both be completed in a single session that lasts approximately 3 to 4 hours. Don't forget to review the adventure background, or the adventure background, and NPCs, non-player characters, prior to the session. This information is crucial to smoothly running a game, of course. <sighs> Don't run anything off the cuff without studying the adventure beforehand. Unless you're doing it freestyle entirely. Or are just going to end up freestyling real quickly. Because, <laughs> yeah. 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 It usually, I usually study things and make my own notes and stuff. And it takes a couple, good couple hours over, like, the adventure runtime. <laughs> like, in addition. When I run a mod. Or a module. The first step of the game is an introduction to the world and the city the players find themselves in. During this portion of the game, the players find themselves thrown into the bodies of the characters they created. They know what they would normally know on Earth, but have no knowledge of the place they're in. They won't recognize each other and will have to tell the other players what they see when they look at them. However, they will intuitively know that they have magical ability if they are a spellcaster and can learn how to channel that in early encounters in the game. The NPCs they meet in this section will influence their perspectives of this world. So it's an isekai. It's an isekai. It 
Information about the planet from the adventure backgrounds and overview sections can be provided at GM discretion through these encounters. The guides are included at each, at each for what characters may be most likely to share. Although the players will have many paths to explore, they will end up outside the city regardless. How do they ensure that? <laughs> the second part of the adventure is a journey outside the city to nearby ruins, where they will complete a skill challenge and encounter the dragon that was behind the disappearances. They must complete these challenges before they can recover the researchers and get home. Throughout this game, you will find notes for the GM about the DC of various things. These are guidelines to use at GM discretion and adapt to best fit your game plan. I want to make sure I'm able to hear something. Okay. So the adventure backgrounds. Oh, this is quite long. Okay. I mean, it's not like super long, but usually, uh, we can look over a module or something. If you guys are familiar with like, I guess I don't need to bring, I don't need to bring, uh, any existing adventures in or like existing adventures like stuff. Uh, I don't think they're normally this long though for the same amount of data. Or, like, for the same amount of runtime. Generally. Uh, adventure backgrounds. In an age 400 years past, a planet called Exlaris orbited comfortably in its star's habitable zone. Within this delicate zone, the planet grew to support life that became intelligence, developed a robust society, and learned to harness their innate magical capabilities. A peaceful world took shape that prized knowledge above all else. They focused on agriculture and bettering their societies through medical research and honing their magical abilities. The magic of this world came about when a small group of inhabitants discovered that they have the ability to harness the energy of the vacuum, the energy filling the universe around them. More information found in Appendix A. Shall we jump? Is this linked? It is linked. It is linked. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to jump. Oh, but I won't have a jump back. Um... In this section, you'll find a full explanation of the scientific concepts used throughout the game. Ooh. Neat. Okay. I feel like maybe I should actually save this now. We'll start with at least the first bit. Like, the, the first bullet point. The first... Uh, I feel like I should know what this character is. What... Ah, uh, 117%, huh? What is that character? Oh, you can't see it because of how I cut it off. Um, theta, I guess? It looks kind of like a Theta. Uh, it was... Here we go. Give me a second. What? What is this character? Oh, come on! Let me copy. Let me copy. It's not literally a bullet. It's not... It's not a J. Is it? It kind of looks like that, yeah. It, if, if that can be, like, serifed, it's got, like, more of a capital I with, with serifs on it for the centerpiece. Energy the Vacuum. Energy the Vacuum, an example of the zero-point energy of open space, is a candidate for the source of dark energy. In this game, it is what the magical characters on Exlaris tap into to power their magic as they move through the cosmos. Much like on Earth, there is very little known about this source of power. This is what the researchers were trying to connect to Earth to learn more about. Oh, I feel like this is definitely something I should be reading afterwards if it's kind of a, ah, uh, okay, yeah. That already, it's not like spoiler, but it's more of an, oh, oh, okay. We already have a connection there. So. Energy the vacuum. Neither the ability nor the energy they harness itself has been well understood, but research into it is ongoing. In the meantime, more of the inhabitants of Exlaris have learned to harness this energy, 
though some some through study and others through innate gifts. However, that energy tends to fluctuate and isn't always reliable, hence the eagerness of researchers to more fully understand it so they can fix the problems. However, the peaceful nature of the society changed when a black hole moved close to their planet. Not close enough to consume, but close enough to alter the planet's orbit and slingshot it in, into a trajectory all its own, along with its moon, Noru. Shock roiled through the world's inhabitants, causing an eruption of chaos. Each of the other planets within the solar system suffered the same fate, though Xlaris was the only one that supported life. This event, known as the Breaking, transformed Xlaris into a rogue planet. I feel like this is going to have a lot of concepts that are really cool outside of this outside of this adventure. Some elves and dark elves inhabiting this planet can still remember this time and the utter chaos that followed. As the light of their sun faded into darkness, the inhabitants of the world, Ixlari, hoarded what little they could in order to get by. The peaceful planet of Ixlaris quickly turned into a struggle for survival. Amidst the chaos, an archmage assembled a team of scholars, wizards, sorcerers, and leaders to put the might of their intellect behind this problem. They developed a shield surrounding the planet, which were, would protect them from comets, asteroids, and other hazards of space travel while maintaining the planet's original temperature, mimicking Xlaris' original atmospheric makeup. This shield was created when the archmages wove their magic together, harnessing as much of the energy of the vacuum as they could possibly muster from the universe around them, and intertwining it with the technology they possessed. Because Xlaris was now a rogue planet, they were able to harness even more energy than they had imagined possible. Once the shield took effect and the planet began to stabilize, the mages developed a fear of it being undone. They sealed away knowledge of how they had harnessed so much of the energy of the vacuum, using it only among themselves for the maintenance of the shield. Since they never before had the ability to harness the energy so powerfully, they were secure in the knowledge that it was secret. Within cities, they created lamps using the same energy and technology they had for the shield, though far less powerful than the shield these lamps can mimic the day and night cycles they had while orbiting their sun. And farmers were given extra powerful lamps that could keep crops healthy in order to give the populace fed. Although much of the planet remains in perpetual night, Society began to rebuild itself, and peace returned to the planet. During this time, creatures had emerged from the Underdark, once driven into shadow by an aversion to the light. They now walked freely. That's an interesting way to bring the Underdark above. Hmm. You have a group who wants to play on Underdark characters, but they don't want to be in the Underdark? They want to be kobolds or something? Here's a world for you. Although I guess it's something you have to build around, but depending. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna cut off there. In the wake of the breaking, a new chapter began. The studious ones who saved Exlari were elevated to leadership roles and rebuilt society on the principle of keeping the information open and accessible, a tradition that continues today. Although some people prefer to wander in bands separate from society, most settled back into peace and routine. Exlaris was forever changed, and they had a new focus for their academic interests, the cosmos around them. In the centuries since the breaking, this world's study of the cosmos took shape and honed a focus on studying other worlds like itself, rogue planets, and a special interest in black holes and the energy of the vacuum. In recent years, a mage in Aldeshran, Eric Hazen, developed a spell that allowed him to connect with Earth in a way that allows for more than just observations about the planet, its civilization, and how it moves through its solar system. Eric linked to the Hubble Space Telescope after learning of its observations that propelled understanding of black holes and dark energy, similar to the energy of the vacuum on Earth, and copy data that he and, a select, and select other researchers used to help decode some of the mysteries of their own planet and further drive new areas of research. 
Unknown to them, this drew the attention of a young dragon, Isilius, who stole the spell Eric created, as well as Eric himself and his fellow researchers, in order to steal Hobble itself so Isilus alone would possess its knowledge. <laughs> so that's how Orange Grover, man. A dragon wants the knowledge that's in the Hubble. I mean, if you were a dragon and you saw something like that, you'd probably want it, right? There are five major cities on Exlaris. Aldestron, Sarthelios, Mesca Perea, Paleridian, or Paleridian, sorry, Paleridian, and Arkentnum. Each of these cities has a particular academic focus and trades, trade flows freely, or openly, I should say, trade flows openly between them, most commonly by teleportation spells, but sometimes by braving the dark in between. So thank you, Clover Nutter, for the follow. While each city is home to most of the knowledge and study of a given topic, it is extremely common for researchers to rotate between the cities, learning many different disciplines. Although there are five main cities in this world, there are innumerable smaller uh, towns and cities scattered throughout, some of them with their own unique academic interests as well, while others focus on agriculture, farming, or other facets of society. <laughs> Academics in the dark, or lit only by candlelight. Initially, when it's talking about the like darkness and lamps, all I can think of is King Kingdom Death. A eh? A eh? <laughs> Kingdom Death. I have to figure out where to put my water in now. There's just so much more room. Before it was always a tentative. Like I'm gonna put it over here and pray. Pray to whatever gods may be listening. I'm not going to knock it over. Or it's like too tightly placed. Iron lung setting? Iron lung setting. Let's see. <laughs> oh, is it a... Uh... Oh, oh, okay, that. The thing that went viral, uh, the game that went viral after, uh, that one submarine, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to say, that's kind of, wait, maybe I shouldn't say it's strange. Oh, I, all I can think of when you say, like, wait, it's a submarine, but it's in space. All I can think of is, well, there goes part of the horror of it, I guess, because all you think we got is Futurama, where there's a, it, it is from before the submarine incident, but it became, it got brought back into the news because of the submarine incident. <laughs> like, there's a, there's a comic about this, like, uh, we just made an entire movie about, like, don't do this because it's going to bring unimaginable horrors and like be, be like wicked bad. And then scientists go ahead and make the thing. They make the, the wicked bad thing. Like, look what we made a real thing. Look, we made Skynet. Skynet is a Terminator one, right? <laughs> so I, I mean, again, like, I guess the submarine may have come first, like the actual submarine. Uh, and then Iron Lung afterwards, unrelated. <laughs> but yeah, it um, accidentally rode on the pop, on the on the media event. It's not their fault. Uh, huh? Huh? That's interesting. It's a little ten candlesy then. The world is fading. I mean, there's a, a lot of games that actually... Or I shouldn't even just say games. There are a lot of things that have that sort of premise. Uh, the world is dying. And not just in, like, a small small case, but, like, on a, a universal case. But yeah, when you initially said, like... Uh, well, initially, submarine space. Futurama, there's a, a gag where they have a thing about, like, Oh, we can, we're going fishing and we catch a fish and like, 
oh, we're down at what, like, so much pressure. God. I, I say, like, maybe, well, let's say it's like 100 side presser, pressure or something on the submarine. And it's kind of a, oh, so what can the spaceship take? And the answer was like, well, normally it's in space. So, like, between zero and one. <laughs> so it just starts crumpling. Just starts crumpling. I don't remember. I don't remember Psy very well. Aside from like, okay, it's higher pressure is this. Higher pressure for that is that. <laughs> so numbers are egregiously wrong. I'm guessing, but zero to one atmospheres. Ah, uh, okay. It's been. It's actually been a, a really long time since I've watched a lot of Futurama, but I watched it so much that. I have a decent memory for parts of it, just not numbers. Mm. Okay. Like if I had, if I just spent like a minute, I could probably look up the quote. <laughs> So cities and basic info. Aldostron is astrophysics. Sarthelios is solar science. Oh, Helios. Okay, I see. Uh, Basca Perea, biological systems. Sorry. Paleridon is planetary science. And Arketnum is aeronautics. Hmm. I wonder what the connection is for the names. Since I see like Helios for solar science, it's kind of a, the others have got to have something too, right? What's the connection there? Oh no, my Photoshop check fell. Thank you for the water. I'm going to put my Photoshop check back. Where do I put it? Where do I put it? Uh, oh wait, I put it up here. Uh, I put it up there. Thank you for the water. So most of it is set in Aldestron. This is where our adventure is set. The largest of the cities, it serves as the capital and largest hub of academic research as well as trade. It's split into inner and outer. Inner Aldestron lies atop a large flat top plateau where the observatory, university, and various trades operate. Outer Aldestron sprawls outward and several miles from the base of the plateau, with the oldest buildings at the base of the plateau. Populated by farmers, Outer Aldestron is much newer than the plateau. Farmland surrounds it, which is permanently illuminated by daylight, even when the rest of the world is deep in the night. It is thus the most fruitful and heavily worked farmland on the planet. Huh. Hmm. Uh, the thing is... I think constant daylight is not great either. Constant daylight is not great. <laughs> I wonder. I'm sure they know what they're doing though. Hmm. Interesting concept. I wonder how they scale the difference. If they've got like elevators basically. Actually, I think they talked about, like, flying, didn't they? Um, although I also imagine that people probably don't move a whole lot. Necessarily. Aside from maybe those independents. Ooh. Yeah, there's some really interesting... Places like that. There's also the ones that are like entirely made out of ice. There's also something I saw on Twitter. It's a walk around, I think, of a of a room in I say a room. It's it's hard to call it a room. A maybe studio isn't the right word either. Something kind of like a studio in Japan. Uh, and basically the entire outside is like the kitchen and the bathroom. <laughs> And I guess the interior, I'm assuming the interior is where you sleep. Maybe. It might not be. It's literally like five feet wide for like the entire thing. Uh, 
And like the the entire edge is window. So you don't have any, you, you have to draw your, I guess, release your blinds, release your blinds if you're showering or something like that or bathing, because it, it really is just glass everywhere on the outside. Hmm. Wait, although there is also the case of what's in the plateau. They're on the plateau. What's in the plateau? What's in the plateau? There's got to be something. You can't just put a plateau, a city on top of a plateau, and then not have something neat inside the plateau. Right? Right? There's going to be something in there. It is in the dark, however, that you find traces of what life was like before the breaking. Some of the major cities at that time did not survive the chaos, and travelers can still find their ransacked ruins. Those who dare to journey within these ruins seldom return, and they are home to various manners of dangerous creatures just waiting, lurking in the dark. This is why most use teleportation to travel. Teleportation on this world is easy between major cities, but less so the more remote the area is. It is done through a series of magically connected portals. Not all portals are open at all times. In many ways, teleportation on Oxlaris is similar to a transport hub in a major city on Earth. That explains a lot, actually. Especially the concept of, like, keys. I wonder how that works, too. They probably don't have to explain any of that because you can just ride on uh, the hand waving that D and D tends to give it, since this is a totally not a D and D adventure. Overview: Exlaris is home to an interesting mixture of life. All creatures have default dark vision because of the environment. Looking around, the players will find a blend of creatures mingling together, from dark elves and elves to orcs and goblins halflings, and tieflings, as well as various mixes of the aforementioned races. The players can quickly surmise that this is a very inclusive society. The civilization on this planet recognizes academics as their primary leaders. Those who devote themselves to study, such as wizards, are shown a special respect, and it is considered their responsibility to help better society with support from law. Within every major city is a major research center specializing in that city's area of focus, as well as university with a more broad curriculum. Even though societal well-being is prized, there's still an underground criminal community. The players will have the opportunity to interact with all these aspects of society as they play through the game, depending on the paths they choose to take. Ooh, so we get options. It's not, it's not completely linear. Hmm. Huh. Huh. Maybe. Maybe, maybe. Uh, let's see. It is the largest. <laughs> oh, thank you for the water. Thank you for the stretch, too. Let me do that. And also the posture check. I just got posture checked, like, 20 seconds. Okay, it's been about a half hour. Oh, God. <sighs> I've been up for a while. With the movie. It was really tough waking up. It was really tough just taking a nap. Uh, it was really tough just taking a nap. Half hour, seconds. <laughs> Look, it really wasn't that long ago, it feels like. Let's see, let's see. 
We were looking at the mix. Right. Right, right, right. I feel like I keep, I keep moving over when I need to be over here. I need to be over here. <laughs> Everything moved. I have to move with it. I have to move with the times. I can't even see the difference with me moving. Uh, I don't know why this feels so awkward to be here. Unless I... Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, sitting in a different position. The game will open with the players entering the city of Aldestron, seemingly through a portal. Since Aldestron is a transportation hub, the players will have become entangled with the individuals on Exlaris, who have been traveling from another city when a spell was cast. As the players explore the town, they will have the opportunity to interact with various NPCs and be introduced to the first plot hook, a string of disappearances. The town is made up of districts, Learning district being in the center and the others spread outward in rings. A handful of businesses are of note, chiefly being the Horsehead Tavern. A tavern situated just outside the town square in the trade district. The Horsehead Tavern can serve as a jumping off point for the game and is home to a potential ally, Failwin. Failwin! The name. Hello, <laughs> dipshit. Welcome. Uh, sorry, Failwin. What a name. Here, the players have the opportunity to test out their new abilities and learn what's going to be in the city, or what's going on in the city, as well as get an assignment from Failwin. When you have that little email, the very first thing I see is, oh, oh, that's a lot of a nerve person. It's not, though. <laughs> oh, Maya. Maya. And the Horsehead Tavern acts as a bridge between an underground criminal network and the more approachable parts of society. The players will have the opportunity here to befriend Damien, whether or not they choose to accept work from Failwin. Damien can help serve as a guide for the players, pointing them where they may need to go, since he is aware of many of the happenings around town. Damien acts as the bartender at the Horsehead Tavern and is the right hand of Failwin. Huh. The little wizard is cute. I'm assuming that's a wizard. It's got a, like, it's got a pointy hat. It's got a pointy hat. And it's kind of, it's, that's not a mace, right? It's not a mace. Oh, thank you for the follow dip shit hit. A stretch. No cracks. Okay, actually, there was a crack that was in my neck. Does that count? <laughs> Normally, they're more like slingshots, huh? Uh, reading random stuff online. I I went with some other people to see Ava, <laughs> and I actually. During the, there's a midpoint where, where they, I don't want to say swap movies, but like it's broken into two pieces. So during the midpoint, I, I didn't start an argument exactly, but more like, wait, but like, do you remember which one came first? Which of the seeds? And they're like, what? What do you mean seeds? So it's just sort of like, wait, am I, where am I at? Am I misimagining things? And then. Then the rest of Ava happens, and none of that really mattered exactly, so. I kind of forgot that it was split, and also that the first part of the split is a lot of action, I guess. Maybe I should say a lot of action, but, like, the, the vibes definitely change in between the two pieces. <laughs> I, also, I also got to spend some time with my family before that and oh what movie are you going to see it's it's an anime 
oh, what about what about your nephew? Would he enjoy seeing it? I am so glad that he had absolutely no interest in seeing it. Because I did not realize the first five minutes of that scene. He He's old enough in human society that it's fine. It's just I'm not going to be the one to bring that. I'm not going to I'm not going to be the one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also, apparently he saw the the TV series um and he didn't he, he didn't really he didn't like the ending. He didn't get the ending, of course. So, that's fine. That's fine. It it didn't really make itself very easy. How do you feel about existential dread? Um for him, I'm thinking I don't actually know what series I, okay. I say that I know what series he used to like. And the answer is they weren't ex existential dread ones. <laughs> Literally the first five minutes has that scene along with a bunch of like, not a bunch of other stuff. It's just more like, <sighs> I guess there's really only like, aside from the extreme violence, which feels like nothing nowadays, honestly. And they're like, Entire minute plus of flashing lights. There's that the Masato scene, which is not nearly as bad as I feel like it gets called out for being. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when she dropped at the end after that, though, someone, someone uh, called down the theater, Pop Goes the Weasel. But they were silent for most of the rest of it, so. Yeah. I mean, I've already corrupted him. I handed him a whole bunch of DVDs, anime DVDs, and and let him rifle through my manga. He basically took the, all the things I didn't care about anymore. Uh, so that was when he was a couple years younger than he is now. <laughs> he was a teenager in human terms. Uh, but yeah, such as... What titles? Uh, I'll, basically a whole bunch of Funimation DVDs. A whole bunch of Funimation DVDs. So he liked Shakugan Oshana. Uh, I don't remember if... I don't remember if Rosario Vampire was in there. That was another one that I, we had a conversation about. Oh, it's this old anime. I don't know if you'd know about it. I I watched that when you were in diapers, little man. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, this was ages ago. Um, and they were old DVDs at the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the manga, the manga. I I think I gave him my kitchen princess. I I don't remember. I just say that because I remember that being one of those things like, I'm not going to read it again. I'm going to see if he cares before I like go donate it or try and sell it or mostly donate. Uh, I think I just remember taking a few things off the list because it was kind of like, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give him MPD Psycho. I think I still have MPD Psycho, but just anything of that's here uh, that I'm getting rid of, I am not giving to him. At least not now. I feel like there may have been some Dragon Ball in there too, but I could be wrong. It was the age where Blu-rays, they were starting to do a lot of the Blu-ray DVD combo sets. Maybe I, hmm. I don't remember what Funimation got. I keep wanting to say Powerpuff Girls. It's not Panty and Stocking. You might have gone Panty and Stocking. Mm, okay. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, something that's been surprising is how did he has been coming around on Twitter and people talking about that and and like one of her early scenes. Not like from the first episode, but from like a later one. Yeah. I, maybe it's just my Twitter, my Twitter following, whatever. And people complaining like, this is a horrible thing. It's kind of a, yeah, she's a, she's not a good character. 
She's not like, I shouldn't say she's not a good character. She is not a good person. She's not a good person. I didn't really like the first Hari season. The second Hari season has like another big thing, which if you know, you know. But I guess a lot of people don't don't know how to eat. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. <sighs> but yeah, it's kind of a yeah, yeah. People didn't really talk too much about how she was a horrible person at the time, but uh Yeah. Well, I mean, she has major, major flaws. <laughs> yeah. Kill can fix her. Depending on the theory you subscribe to, he absolutely could have. He could have made it so that was never a fucking issue. I, I haven't read the novels. Uh, I don't know if it even finished. Like the novels. What what is the latest Haruhi that's out? Let's see. Haruhi novels. Did he ever finish? Twelve volumes out as of twenty twenty. Huh, looking through this. I don't know if it's considered a finished storyline. Yeah, looking at the synopsis of the latest Haruhi book, light novel, it doesn't look like the story is finished. It kind of looks like he doesn't want to finish, it feels like. Mm, yeah. Yeah, supposedly, okay. Actually, huh, 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 give me a second. So the English says that it's an ongoing thing. Let's switch to Japanese. And does it say it's, yeah, ongoing since 2003, 12 novels. There was a nine year break between the last one that came out and the one before that. And it's been four, nearly four years since the last one. Uh, he just doesn't want to finish it. But for those, this is a series that's been out for ages, right? Uh, the concept of Kion might actually be the... Kion is the one who actually holds the reins. It just looks like Haruhi. Yeah. Yeah, it just looks like Haruhi uh, is the one. He... It, I mean, it opens with him, like, not wanting to be the protagonist. He wants to be a sidekick. And that's what he is to Haruhi, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, kind of, uh... Kion... John made her worse to begin with. John made her worse. He could fix her. He has to want to fix her. And she's probably more fun broken. Okay, let's see. <laughs> Yeah. They're entertainments. They're entertainments. It's always dinner in a show. Okay, so actually this is a new page. Yep. Okay, we, we I didn't finish I just didn't even start this page. Page seven. If you're lucky if you're lucky they'll cook. Also in the trade districts, the players will find the headquarters of the guard. The guard is made up of a variety of interesting individuals, all cloaked in navy to allow them to slip around the city unnoticed if they choose. The guards are led by Roxana Trebalan, 
a neutral good half-orc who wants to city, see the city thrive. Their primary mission is protecting and supporting the citizens, a mission they take extremely seriously. If the players choose to affiliate with the guard, they will find them trustworthy compatriots and a good source of work. No guard patrols can be timed throughout the city. There is always a chance of a hidden guard lurking nearby in the shadows, keeping an additional set of eyes on things. In recent weeks, the presence of the guard has increased as some of the leading researchers at the observatory have been going missing. The entire city is on high alert as both Captain Traban and Failwin devote their respective energies into finding out what's going on. Both had been aware of what these, or that these individuals were reaching, rarching? Sorry, both had been aware that what these individuals were researching, ah, researching, okay. What they were researching could have great importance. So far, their efforts have yielded a little fruit aside from a direction. Something is lurking in the ruins outside the city. Something neither of them have been able to get close to as of yet. Oh, they're messing an S and an E. Or an E and an S. Look, InDesign is hard. InDesign is hard. <laughs> there may or may not... Actually, I don't... Do I? I don't think I have that installed anymore. I could check right now if they have it. Uh, if they have. <sighs> Spell check. <laughs> Tensions in the city have been running high as the disappearances stretched on with no answers. Students have begun leaving the university and heading for other cities. And the general townsfolk wonder if the guards have become lax or if there's a greater conspiracy afoot. The longer this goes on, the higher tensions have been getting. There's an air of fear and distrust around Aldestron. On a peaceful world, any disappearance within a city is rare, much less multiple ones. Some fights have begun breaking out in the streets, squares, and taverns as people hurl accusations for the disappearances. Did one on purpose. Did what on purpose? <laughs> I honestly don't know. Oh, the grammar. It aren't that hard. Ah... Uh... Okay. At least you can spell it. <laughs> U N Y. The recent disappearances consist of four high profile academics that research at the observatory Eric Hazen, Zyania Hesk, Telton Theridine, Theridine? Okay. and Gav Grenner. Cav Grenner. Cav Grenner. These individuals have recently been studying the breaking, looking for other rogue planets and black holes, as well as information about the energy of the vacuum that, though they have been using for centuries, they know very little about, trying to answer the questions of their situation and wondering how unique it is. As they have been conducting their study, they were connecting with Earth, specifically the Hubble Space Telescope, to serve as a basis for what Xlaris could have been or was once like, and acting as a comparison for the differences between planes. However, as they were going through this research, Hubble itself disappeared, and to the people of Earth it seemed as if the telescope had never existed at all. Huh. That's... hmm. Fearing their magic as the cause, but not knowing where the Hubble ended up, the researchers who later went missing cast a spell similar to the one that they had used to copy the Hubble data, but this time designed to bring the consciousness of individuals who had worked with the Hubble Space Telescope on Earth to get their help finding and returning the telescope. Not knowing when these individuals would show up, the researchers sent word to their allies through Aldestron, telling them to watch for individuals who may be out of place, individuals they suspected would come through the portal. They made sure it was known that those individuals should be brought to the observatory when they arrived. 
So they only brought the consciousness, not the bodies. Oh. <laughs> uh, each of these individuals, or sorry, each of these researchers went missing before the individuals they sent for arrived. They were all taken by the dragon Isilius, who had stolen Eric's spell and instead of copying data, used it to transport Hubble itself, then captured the researchers in order to make it function on Mixolaris and keep the information for itself, believing that would make it the most powerful creature on the planet. I learned space-time magic but accidentally teleported away a multi-million dollar satellite. That's not what happens, though. <laughs> the dragon deliberately teleports it away. I learned space-time magic and forgot to bring the bodies back. <laughs> the summary was saying that the researchers thought their magic did it, but it turns out it's actually the dragon that did it. Okay, non-player characters, the NPCs. Roxana Traban, a 40-year-old female half-orc, a tall and imposing figure with hair always tied up and numerous visible scars over muscle. Neutral good. Captain Traban has worked for the city guards since she came of age, developing a reputation for getting to the bottom of problems plaguing the city and keeping the good of the citizens at heart. If the players choose to accept the work of solving the disappearances from her, she will be a steady and trustworthy ally. However, if the players demonstrate that they are not working for the good of society, she will become hostile. If the players associate with Failwin, she will keep an eye on them. And if they are forthcoming on their alliance with Failwin to her, she will warn them to pursue better allies. Though they have a tense truce, neither Failwin or Roxana trust each other, even though they recognize each other's roles in maintaining order. In rare circumstances, they have and will work together. Hmm. Just more so. Uh-huh. Uh, that's good information, I suppose. I suppose none of the rest really matters. Morgan Sherry is the next one. Who I don't think was mentioned previously. A 50-year-old non-binary human. Long brown hair with streaks of silver. Lawful good. Morgan Charlie has been the head researcher at the observatory for about a decade, devoted to providing the best environment for researchers to pursue their interests. They have built the observatory into a creative powerhouse where research frequently tests conventional ideas. They are driven by the urge to understand, and new information will be met with instant curiosity and scribbling notes in a nearby notebook. Though they rarely leave their office, they pride themselves on an open-door policy and will welcome the characters when they come in in search of information, always offering tea and sometimes cookies. <laughs> Had research here, but they're not disappeared. I wonder... Wait, hold on. Okay, yeah. So high profile ones, but not the head one yet. I wonder if he's going to go disappearing after, during a part of it to like help basically create a timer. It's not just random people that you don't care about. It's this guy who gave you tea and cookies. It's this person that gave you tea and cookies. So Damien is a greater than 200 year old dark elf male. Yeah, yeah, that's greater than, right? That's greater than the, the alligator eats the... Wait, less than? I thought the alligator eats the bigger number. Fuck. <laughs> Damn it. Okay. 200 is bigger than his age? Okay, <laughs> this is why numbers, numbers hard. 
Numbers hard. <sighs> Mamas don't let your children grow up to be beat supers. Okay. Dark skin and shoulder length white hair. True neutral. Less than 200 year old. Less than 200 year old dark elf male. The bartender and right hands of Felwyn is one of the first NPCs the players are likely to encounter. He's always ready to pour a drink, serve a meal, and listen to what the characters have to say with a smile. The face of the Horsehead Tavern can be rather insightful, and is the gateway for the characters to meet his boss, Failwyn, to whom he is extremely loyal. He spent the past few decades working at the Horsehead Tavern and working his way up to acting as Failwyn's right hand. Though friendly, he keeps a pair of daggers on him in case there's trouble. He was once a hopeful young student at the university, but after a few tough breaks, left that path, and eventually found a place working for Failwyn. He's far more trustworthy than his employer. It can easily be befriended. Falwyn is a 400 plus year old elven female with long blonde hair. Chaotic neutral, but can cross into chaotic evil depending on player actions. Okay, so Damien's neutral. Falwyn is chaotic neutral slash evil. Mm, okay. Isilius is the only other evil, it seems like. Owner of the Horsehead Tavern, Felwyn has spent the past century or more in the city of Aldestron, becoming involved in every aspect of what goes on in town. 400? <laughs> plus? Greater than 400? Yeah, I just... Give me, give me the plus sign. <laughs> give me the plus sign, please. I understand that they also have different purposes, like less than 200 versus greater than 400. Yeah. But you want to say they're no older than 200. Or they have to be greater than 400. Yeah. Owner of the Horsehead Tavern, Phelan has spent the past century or more in the city of Aldestron, becoming involved in every aspect of what goes on in town. There are a few things she isn't aware of, and can be a very valuable, a fickle ally for the party. Once a lauded researcher herself in the wake of the breaking, she has first-hand knowledge of some of the more powerful magical workings of the world, but she had no desire to be under a spotlight and held to a high standard of leadership. She is highly analytical, and if the party is forthcoming at their first meeting, she will be a good source for offering work. She and Roxana Traban don't trust each other, and if the players affiliate with her, she will encourage them not to mention their affiliation to Captain Traban. Valwyn is a shadowy figure, and inside checks on her are at a high DC, revealing only that she works for her own devices. However, if there is need, she will lend the support of her network to the players. Next. Isilius. A young green dragon, approximately 70 years old. Chaotic evil. 70? That is quite young for a dragon, isn't it? It's quite young for a dragon. I keep inching closer to the paper. I keep inching closer to the paper. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> oh, I'm wondering if actually... Yeah, I'm getting quieter when I do that, too. When I do this. Frick. Uh, maybe. No, it doesn't. It doesn't feel that way. Damn it. Damn it. Okay. Isilia spends their first four decades traveling around the planet, keeping to the dark and managing to outwit adventurers who came after them. About 30 years ago, they settled in the ruins of Moksana and began to amass a hoard of knowledge claiming the ruined city's extensive library. This wasn't enough to satisfy their greed for long, so they began making trips to the cities in elven form, 
though their magic wasn't powerful enough to completely disguise the green hue of their skin. Hmm. This desire for knowledge beyond their own eventually drove Asilius to steal the Hubble Space Telescope and kidnap the researchers the players will be trying to recover. Hmm. Uh, one thing that's unusual in this is that normally, depending on the magic chosen, uh, I believe that dragons in 5e, only the metallics have a shapeshift attached to their... I shouldn't say it's a shapeshift. They have an ability that allows them to shapeshift uh, attached to their sheets, basically. And the chromatics don't get that by default. However, I think that there is a sidebar talking about how you can add spell casting to like add spells, add spells to your dragons. Why the fuck not? So it could always just be a spell or they could do the normal thing and just say, fuck it. All dragons have the option to do that. Pretty much all dragons have the option to shape, to, to change their shape. I'd imagine some of them may not do that because it kind of goes against their vibes. I can't really imagine a white dragon doing it, for instance, even if they have the ability to. Uh, but a green dragon could. A green dragon could. Kind of surprised that I just say that there. But yeah, this is this is very stereotypical green dragon behavior, isn't it? They like knowledge uh, and collecting people, especially more than they do a lot of other types of treasures, which makes them interesting. There's not going to be a pile. Of, there could still be okay a pile of gold at the end of a a green dragon uh, fight. However. You might just find some of their latest prizes, prize people. And maybe, I guess, a Hubble Space Telescope. So the next one is Eric Hazen. Yeah. Look, I feel like to a red dragon, a space telescope is not going to be worth nearly as much as it is to a green dragon. Like, the craftsmanship, I don't know. It's not, it's kind of like weird. It's fine craftsmanship, but the purpose of the craftsmanship is not, is very functional under specific circumstances. <laughs> so I feel like that kind of limits the monetary value. Versus like, I guess a gem? The monetary value of a gem. But I guess that's just what value is assigned. But it is really shiny, and I don't actually know what the Hubble Space Telescope looks like. Is it? Does it look shiny and cool? I guess we're going to find out, huh? So Eric Hazen is approximately 40 years old. Uh, male purple tiefling. Lawful good. Eric has always loved to study. He has seldom been seen without a book in his hand his entire life. Because of this, research was a natural career move, and he loves his work at the observatory. He developed a spell that can allow him to connect with, other, with another plane and transfer data, allowing the use of knowledge from Earth, specifically the Hubble Space Telescope, to fuel his and others' research into help, or to help figure out not only the mysteries of their world, but of the universe around them and extending to other planes. The extensive use of the energy of the vacuum on Nixlaris has always made Eric nervous, since they know so little about it. His primary goal for connecting with the Hubble Space Telescope was to learn more about this mysterious substance and work toward making it a safe, reliable, and sustainable source of energy, or indefinite energy, for their world. Hmm, <laughs> hmm. Demon-based CPUs? Huh. 
That feels very like Warhammer <laughs> in a messed up way. Mm-hmm. Actually, I know because they have a thing like Oh, uh, this is probably simplifying it down a lot. Uh, something I learned from a Warhammer streamer. 40k specifically. So, I guess they uh, some they aren't allowed to... Humanity oftentimes won't use computers. So instead they'll, like, make a person into a computer for them, basically. So it's just sort of like... The, is there another group that does something similar with demons? Like, they're not very good with technology, but let's just... Use a demon for it. Let's just put a... Let's just stuff a demon in there. Shimigami Tensei spinoffs? I don't know anything. I know, like, so little about Shimigami Tensei. I know more about Persona. Drac Mechanicum? Give me a second. Oh, Dark. Dark Mechanicum. Okay. Probably not drag. Mm, traitorous tech priests. Ooh, ooh. Hmm. God, there's so much. I hate to be like, oh my god, there's so much text. <laughs> it's just like, oh god, this really is very, 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 very long. Post heresy. I'm gonna I'm gonna add that to the tab count for now. How much hell spawn per CPU? I like to think of it as like horsepower, right? It's like horsepower. Average it out. They don't. I didn't see it specified in the early part, but I'm sure it's somewhere in there, given how detailed 40k tends to be. Just thinking they do talk about like how much the emperor needed to I don't want to say eat, but like how much the emperor needs to eat at a certain point and then how much he needs to eat nowadays. No, I'm not gonna become a Warhammer scholar. I'm not gonna become a Warhammer scholar. That is I feel like I have I have another depending on like how how well my life is lived, so to speak. Like, it could be another 300, 400, 500 years, right? Maybe even longer, maybe. I don't know about that one. I I feel like I don't have the time to do Warhammer. <laughs> I don't know if I have the time to do Warhammer. Information is is being generated at such a fast pace. It's, it's, it feels impossible to dig into history and also keep up with current events at the same time. Much less make your own stuff. Much less make your own stuff. Unless I can double dip, you know. Stream a Warhammer game. <laughs> I shouldn't, I shouldn't be teasing with that one. <laughs> Okay, that's that's Warhammer Fantasy though. That's Warhammer Fantasy. That's Warhammer Fantasy. It's not Warhammer 40k. Those are two separate things. It was probably kind of funny though. That's like my the very first Warhammer game I played is fucking Blood Bowl. Necromunda, Space Marine. I I don't know what those words are. I don't know what those words are. I know, okay, I know what a Space Marine is. I didn't know it was a game name, too, I'm guessing, based on the way that you worded it. And same thing with Necromunda. Is Necromunda the name of a game only, or is it also a faction? Okay, so we're right through Eric Kazan. Space Marines are a faction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're a really big faction, <laughs> They're a really popular faction, you know, being being a lot of humanity, but not necessarily all of it, considering uh heresy. Z uh Zyania Hesk. Zyania Hesk. A mid twenties human female, lawful neutral. 
The youngest of the missing researchers, Xania acts as Eric's right hand. She's fascinated by Earth and will most likely ask the players a great deal of questions while taking notes. Her research focuses on ways she could try to restore Ex Laris to what it had been like before the breaking. Uh, hello? Welcome, Raiders. Welcome, Masaku. What were you up to? They will tell me in a second. They will tell me in a second. Uh, for those who don't know me, I am the Evening from Rose. I'm a garden elf. And tonight we're looking through the NASA RPG. The, the NASA RPG. Uh, it's a little cut off. This, this image is a little cut off. I will bring up the poster instead. We're going to open this. Uh, we are reading NPC bits. We're basically just having a chill time, like flipping through, flipping through, reading through. It's about being isekai into a fantasy world. And <laughs> shortly, at some point after being isekai in, you are voluntold to go help with this problem. Because you're the isekai heroes. Because you're the isekai heroes. <laughs> oh, Bellatro, I hope you're having fun with that. I still haven't actually sat down and watched someone play it. But I do hear it's it's card game. It's gamba. It's it's poker, but not. <laughs> oh, we're not doing any rolling. <laughs> Poker, roguelike, roguelites, roguelite, roguelike, roguelites. Escaflone to get our telescope back. Except there's one, there's one vital difference between like Escaflone and this. And that is in Escaflone, Hitomi comes over and she has her body. She's still wearing her school uniform and everything, right? That's, a, that's kind of a weird thing to wear in your average average fantasy world. It's like Hagome and her schoolgirl outfit. You know, the schoolgirl outfit is the fucking marker that I don't belong here. Here, they're isekai and I think they actually took over the bodies of people who are already on the planet. They do, they just do a quick little switcheroo or something or they get subsumed temporarily or maybe permanently, I don't know. We'll find out, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> and we've already kind of been told like the big twist to this, I should say. Maybe I shouldn't say twist, but like we're we're getting the ZM's view, right? Uh, a dragon stole the the Hubble Space Telescope, and also the people, and also people researchers, because green dragons like to collect knowledge, and they also like to collect people. They like to collect cool people, and who's more cool than smart people? Yeah, a dragon stole NASA's funding. And no one on Earth gave a shit about the Hubble Space Telescope going away. No one, no one cared. Ah, okay. No dungeon crawling makes it a roguelite versus a roguelike. Huh. I'm not going to remember that. But thank you. I'm going to try, but I'm not going to. Unless I make it a post-it note. And I don't know if that's worthy of a post-it note. Yet. This is just John Carter? Wait, seriously? <laughs> this is just John Carter of Mars? I haven't actually read John Carter or watched it. But I did bring it up in the past because it has, like, bad... Bad, uh... It suffers from poor naming. Or at least the... The... Movie suffered from poor naming. Roguelites adopt only a few key features of rogue. Rogue likes are much closer in design. Huh. So, okay. I guess what counts as a rogue? Hmm. Unless rogue is the name of a game that everyone is copying, which I highlights out. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, that explains a lot. That explains so much. Huh.
I really hope that one's going to stick because that, that, that just kind of like slammed a whole bunch of keys into place. Well, some of us go, I know it is, it is late on a Sunday if you, actually wait, it's still kind of late for you, but if you need to like get there or something, I totally understand. <laughs> <coughs> or a drink because you know, it's St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> so treat yourself. Hope we have, hope we have something nice. Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> Thank you, Masoku, but... Mm. I... I... I embarrass myself by not knowing which... which how to read a, a less than sign. You never did... Wait, do they stop selling them, like, tomorrow or something? The Shamrock Shake? I don't think shamrock steaks are like all that great, but I guess it does change up monotony potentially. As I have like here a slowly warming leftovers of some mangonada. Uh... Also, I found out today that actually mangonada straws are an actual candy. And it's kind of a, oh shit, I should have been eating them the entire time. I should have been eating this the entire time. What have I been doing with my straws? I thought it was pretty much just like the chili powder, but no. It's actually like a tamarind candy straw. <laughs> and you can eat the outside. Like, you need to be strong enough to eat the outside. Uh, mangonada, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a, let me grab a picture of mangonada. What to do... When watching Ava, but go for tacos. <laughs> let's see, let's see. What's a good picture of a manganata? This is fine. This is fine. Um, oh, I need to. Oh, this is going to get funky real quick. Actually, I wonder if this will work. I wonder if this will work. Hold on. Is Lyman talk? Is it's Feliz Jueves, okay? It's Feliz Jueves. <laughs> okay. It's not thirsty either. No, it's Thursday in my heart because Oscar. Thursday in my heart because of Oscar. Okay, here we go. Maybe this will work. Okay, here's a mangonada. Here's multiple mangonadas. So the... I, I don't actually know everything that goes inside of it, but basically it's a mango sorbet mixed with mango chunks. Uh, and there's like a chili lime salt thing going on too powder um so you get pockets of like sweet tangy um spicy and then there's a straw that is coated in tamarind and like chili salt lime stuff i think too it's a the, the straws you can buy them separately so it's they're basically just it's kind of like a you guys don't know what a 99 cone is um I guess maybe you could consider it a little bit like a blizzard, except not like a Dairy Queen blizzard. Cause they like put existing candies into a drink, right? Like a kind of a very sweet drink, um, kind of ice creamy, but not quite. Uh, yeah. So it's kind of like that, except it's a straw and you also get a second straw because you can't, it's really hard to drink through the, through the, uh, manga, not a straw. Through the tamarind one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I've never actually... I've, I've, I've eaten parts of the straw before, but I didn't know if it was okay or not. And now I know it's fine. I just have to... I just have to be strong. I just have to be strong. I miss the Nerds Blizzards so much. Thank you, d, &D Live Presents, for the follow. 
As I'm sitting here talking about mangonadas instead, let me let me grab that down. But yeah, that's a mangonada. I would suggest trying them out if you have the option to. They are not alcoholic, as far as I know. Like maybe there are groups out there that make it alcoholic, but like if you order one off a menu, I would assume it's be non-alcoholic. <laughs> I heard someone describe it actually as a kid's drink. And it's just kind of like, why you gotta make me feel, <laughs> feel like that? No, why do you gotta make me feel like that? Didn't stop me from ordering it though. <laughs> Let me put that away. Ah, uh, wait. How does this go? Actually, maybe I can just leave it up. Maybe I can just leave it up. What do I need down there anyway? Shirley Temples. I feel like. What's the comparison? All that sugar, you better not give it to a kid. You think so? I mean, people give their... It's, it's like a dessert. It's a dessert. Speaking of which, so I did go to a bar last night, and it did... The appetizer, the listed appetizer for their St. Patrick's Day special was beer. One of the two desserts that they had was beer. I mean, it was a $5 beer. <laughs> but just like, yeah, yeah. The worst part is that they, the only cider they had on tap was Strongbow. So it's just sort of like, I'm, I'm only doing this because it's the only thing on this menu that I feel like I, I can drink. <laughs> it's the only thing I think I can drink. Uh, I can feel, I can feel, I can feel generations looking down upon me for that one. <laughs> It's fine. <laughs> I actually did get the side eye from my grandmother at one point for doing that on a, I think it was on a St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Coincidentally, Strongbow is not a good name <laughs> for elves. For garden elves. <clears throat> Not a good person. Okay, I think we were reading Zyania Hesk. Mm. Historical figure. So Zyania Hesk, we were midway through. Her goal is to eventually become a head researcher herself, and she's on an excellent trajectory to do so. She's very sharp and insightful, but remains measured. While Eric is prone to go down rabbit holes in specific areas of research, Zania is more of a big picture thinker and can more easily see how the different pieces fit together. Better thing than weak foe. <laughs> it's a good name. It's just a bad person behind the name, depending on perspective. Depending on perspective. Oh, we have two more NPCs. Oh, these are some of the other researchers. These are some of the other researchers. It's right, there are four that are missing. <clears throat> so we have a six-year-old halfling female, chaotic good. Telton has been a researcher most of her life, but her tendency to chase random ideas has kept her from advancing in her career. Not that she minds. She'd rather have fun with what she's studying, and she's happy with her work. When Eric approached her to add her unique lens of looking at things to his research group, she was glad to be involved in something so new and interesting. She can easily be distracted, but is also a keen observer, and players would have a hard time getting anything by her. Then we have Cav Grenner, who's a 35-year-old orc male. Neutral good. <laughs> Yeah. No, that's that's coincidental. That's a coincidence. Uh 
Cav is a gentle soul and prefers the company of books rather than most people. He enjoys being the resident lecturer at the observatory and has no desire to do anything else. Even his involvement in research is sporadic. He usually has to be nudged into it by the head researcher, but his fellows appreciate his insights. His true love is fostering young minds, and he's willing to sometimes bend the rules if it helps students. Always soft-spoken and ready to provide players with some soothing tea and conversation, he never fails to be a calming presence. Hmm. Kind of a... Someone who goes hand-in-hand with Morgan Sherry, then. With the tea. The good professor. But he's actually a professor and not just a researcher. Well, actually, maybe because he's lecturer. Lecturer, professor. <sighs> just because you're a professor doesn't mean that you actually do any lecturing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's kind of like an umbrella. Professor covers both in research and lecture. Are kind of like two, two circles inside of that. There's like a, a Venn diagram of this stuff. <laughs> the stage is set. The game will not open on the characters, but on the players themselves on planet Earth. At least one version of Earth. One without the Hubble Space Telescope. As you introduce your players to the story, keep in mind that in a different timeline with Hubble, they were all involved in the mission. This will be revealed to them at the conclusion. Because of this difference, they may feel there is something missing in their world. Use the text below to introduce your players to the story. Back in 1990, NASA launched a revolutionary new observatory called the Hubble Space Telescope into low Earth orbit. About the size of a school bus, Hubble was destined to change humanity's view of the cosmos with its high-resolution view of the universe. By placing the telescope above Earth's murky atmosphere, it would be able to observe space without any interference from clouds, light pollution, or atmospheric distortions. Hubble's vision sees beyond what the human eye can, extending into ultraviolet and near-infrared ranges. The, pla the placement and design of this telescope would revolutionize our understanding of the cosmos, launching an era of unparalleled astronomical discovery. Plus, Hubble's design included the ability to be serviced in space by astronauts, which allowed the telescope to be repaired and upgraded multiple times. But in this world, it's as if Hubble never even existed. And in a world without Hubble, nobody knows the age of our universe, or that black holes lurk in the center of galaxies, or just how much beauty the cosmos contains. Without Hubble, there is also no James Webb Space Telescope. Without the critical experience of servicing missions completed by astronauts in space, the International Space Station also never happened. Technology that detects cancer, tracks endangered species, decodes ancient manuscripts, and more is also lacking. You and your friends work at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Maryland, it's Maryland. <laughs> your jobs are exciting and fulfilling, and you discover more about your planet and universe every day. We can never shake the feeling that something big is missing. A subtle ache lives in your mind, insisting that you're forgetting something, but it's always just out of reach. The more you try and remember, the worse the pain gets. Each of you experience this feeling, but lately it's impossible to ignore. You suggest a group walk around Goddard's campus to clear your heads. But as you wander around the buildings, your head begins to hurt and the exhaustion becomes overwhelming. It's almost like you're dozing off. You quickly realize that's not the case. Suddenly, the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end and you're pulled into darkness. There's no pseudo-hydra in here. They wouldn't do that to us. It's just a regular owl dragon. <laughs> Probably. Although that would be an interesting way of going about it too, but I don't think they... Uh, they can't. Pseudo-hydras work on people, not objects, right? Unless you wanted to make a techno pseudo hydra. Imagine, okay, okay, sorry, like a pseudo hydra, but a sci-fi, like for a sci-fi campaign. Uh, so like there's something weird happening in a space. So, you know, the typical, you come across a spaceship, a, a ghost ship, if there's a pseudo, a, a cyber pseudo hydra. <laughs> 
in the in the ghost ship. And it's going to try and hitch a ride in yours. So instead of the zombie thing, your players are going to be expecting a zombie or something like that. Or like an alien, right? But a cyber pseudo hydra. That could be an interesting one shot. <laughs> we have a hydra. Uh, no. Does. Okay, maybe I should explain what a pseudo hydra is. Um. <laughs> Uh, let's see if I can find the information for a pseudohydra. Uh, pseudohydras, wait, I don't, I don't, I don't know about Dead Space. I'm sorry. I, I know it's a game. It's a game I don't think I'm ever going to play because I think it's one of those things that's like really, really scary. <laughs> oh, I'm thinking like, okay, I'm thinking False Hydra. My bad. I'm thinking False Hydra. Right? Were you thinking False Hydra 2, Merlin? <laughs> Where, uh, let's see, let's see. Oh, God, no, the, the False Hydra's been longer than that. Where, where is it? You're talking, the one that's kind of based in terms of looks on a redead or something like that, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, Um, I, I really, it's gotta be, yeah, it's gotta be older than 2020. 100%. Who created the false hydra? Arnold Kemp. Uh... Oh, so it's Goblin Punch. Okay, let me look up the Goblin Punch on it because it's probably better to go straight to like, yeah, 2014 because I definitely know that it's been out for way longer. Okay. We're going to swap to this real quick. Oh, this is so, I'm sorry. It's so blinding. Okay. Oh, I need to like recut this. I need to trim I also need to move this down. Rawr. Okay, so I can see where I have some flaws in my setup. Uh, what do I have? I don't have it on this level. I have to go a level deeper. I should fix that later. Okay, actually I'm going to copy that. We're going to copy. We're going to hide it here. I'm going to go back in here, adjust it. So that's the crop. Uh, we're going to do a different one instead. It's going to be closer to like 400 and 400. Actually, you know what? We don't need to do it at all. I'll manually crop. I'll manually crop. I'll manually crop as I need to. And like probably do it to the side. So yeah, goblin punch. Oh, you can't see. Uh, here we go. Here we go. This is it instead. So we have a false hydra. For those who do not know, welcome to false hydra town. Welcome to false hydra town. Mm hmm. I can also provide a link to this too. If you want to read it on your own or save it, you know, for inspiration. Hydra's been around the block. It's been uh, not quite 10 years since since they arrived. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> so they eat people. These are creatures that eat people. Uh, they start as like a little growing thing in town, like hidden in an alleyway or something like that. Uh, like a tiny little thing. Um, and as they eat more people, they grow larger. Uh, yeah. And yeah, I think this is kind of like based on a read dead image. Or this is a read dead image that they repurposed for this. Uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> Another image to give you an idea. Or I guess it's an enemy from Zelda and not a uh, redead. Huh. Ha 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 ha. 
So it breaks through the soil. Uh, when it sings, it is ignored. It creates gaps in your attention and slips through them. And then it will grow. It eats people. And it stops singing when it eats people. Mm, let's see, let's see. But yeah, so when it eats people, the song that they continue will basically erase them from people's memories. The man has family, friends who will notice his absence. But the song of the Hydra massages their minds, smoothing the wrinkles on their brain. The Hydra has eaten the man who is now known to the Hydra. The song erases the memories from their soft heads. They will not notice his absence, nor remember him. And in this way, the Hydra grows. Its neck stretches long, longer, and with it, its influence. <laughs> The false hydra song hides the memories of the devoured victims in the same way that it hides the false hydra. This is not a perfect system. Wives will wonder why there's a man's, there are men's clothes in their closet. People will notice that no one has lit the street lanterns these last few minute nights. Churches suddenly find themselves without a bell ringer. By and large, these gaps close themselves up. The wife will forget about the clothes as soon as she stops looking at them. Or she will conveniently remember how her brother left them there the last time he visited. Or she will, on some level, recognize the wrongness, wrongness implicit in the clothes and throw them away when moonless night. She will confabulate how are fleeing constantly. Walls, headphones, things like that. Mm. Walls may not necessarily be as good at removing sound as, or like stopping sound as you would think, as I very well know because damn, I can hear so much. And there are walls in between me and other people. Uh, I can hear the bands. It's probably also, you know, magic. Magic ain't gotta explain shit. Uh, but yeah, so this is just more of a what if this but in space? What if this but in space? Yeah, so everything's based, uh, the appearance is based on this creature. Welcome on, Zelly. Oh, this is kind of a side trip from what we were discussing, but it was kind of a uh, what, what if. What if it wasn't a, a green dragon doing this? That Because of the uh, stages set and talking about it, the Hubble never existed. And it's kind of a, what if it was a Hydra? And it's kind of, or, you know, a false Hydra. And it's kind of a, well, hi false Hydras don't eat things. But what if it was a technology eating false Hydra? <laughs> Let me adjust this again. Oh, it's so small. Where the hell did it go? Where did I put it? I'm going to have to adjust this. We're going to reset. Ooh, that's, that's tiny. How did I... How did I do this? Did I... Accidentally... Oh God, what did I do? <laughs> You're seeing how the meat is made. You're seeing how the meat is made. Avert your eyes. It's not gonna be pixel perfect this time. Before I, I tried to get it pixel perfect on the side so there'd be no like, Weird grayness. And there's also that top. Oh, okay. There's also that top. 
Why did the top not? Thank you for the pet. Uh, it got funny. Actually, I do have one more. I have a different solution. I'm going to actually remove this one. Uh, it'll be fine in a second. It'll be fine in a second. I'm going to go back to this and just enable it back in here. And just slip it to the side. There we go. I know where the gaps are now. What do they do to the Hubble Space Telescope? It's just gone. Old European building. Ah. Uh. <laughs> I've not been lucky. I live, I also live and well, I don't live in an old by European standards house. I live in an old by American standards house. Uh, and part like the, the oldest section is, is pretty good at noises, but there's, so you, I can still hear some stuff because, because of course I can. It's hard. Literal mariachi bands. Literal mariachi bands on Saturday nights, sometimes. Or even not even Saturday, just some nights. <sighs> Why? Why not? As I sit here with my Mongo Nada. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna enjoy it, I guess, while I can. It just interferes with a few things. And I guess I shouldn't say it interferes. I don't know if you guys can hear it. If it does happen, but it, I can hear it in the background and it's just kind of a, I don't want to hear the tuba anymore. I don't want to hear that trumpet anymore. Like once or twice, fine. Every weekend it gets kind of old <laughs> and it kind of, it breaks my immersion. It breaks. It, it literally, I would stop my, I was in a DnZ game the first time I heard it. It was kind of a, I can't tell if this is music from the game online or or if it's in real life, like, I'm sorry, DM. I have to go and check to see if there's actually someone playing the tuba in my neighborhood. And it was. That's kind of a great. Okay. I'm supposed to be playing in like a, a kind of like a dark nautical campaign. And all I got is a fucking tuba in the background interfering. Uh, I honestly have no idea. I have no. Oh, wait, actually. I'm wondering if it's part timers or something, just because I do know some other places where they get people in and it might be, they just know people. Yeah. 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 Tuba fish, saxtopus. <laughs> like, I guess it could be worse. It could be worse. It could be, you know, someone's kid's terrible rock band or something like that. Like, the, whatever it is, they're decent. It's just, I'm not a huge fan. All the time. High schoolers, nasty pop rock for music for a party. Uh... Hmm. Hmm. Just thinking that wouldn't, I guess that could happen. I don't think it's that kind of place though. It's, this is not, uh, oh, you know what? Like there are some neighborhoods that are known for being like college towns. Uh, they would probably, have, I want to say the worst music, but that would definitely be something. I have not talked to, why would I go out and talk to people? Why would I go out and talk to people? No, it's just a different demographic. It's just a unusual demographic. <laughs> I, I didn't even, I, oh yeah. Okay. I shouldn't even say this. I almost didn't ask my neighbors about a cat, the cat, the cat that I ended up taking in. 
It took six months or so for me to find out that uh, one of them actually raised her from a kitten. (laughs) But she was too feral. Or rather, she was... I shouldn't say feral. She was too skittish for, like, indoor life. If I had just done that earlier... Actually, if if my other neighbors actually talked to her, too, because they didn't... They were feeding her, and they didn't know uh, her backstory. The cat's backstory. So I got, like, two different backstories and two different names for her. (laughs) Why do you even go to bars? Uh... To play board games, duh. Why do you go to bars? (laughs) Part one, page 13. So yeah, it does actually have the... This might count as the alt text, honestly. It might count as the alt text. No one plays board games in your bars. You could always be the first, but also I wasn't the first one to start mine, so I can totally understand. I just showed up. I just show up. Then you have to, yeah, okay, I get that too. I mean, do they count as people? They're board gamers. Just think of them as a slightly more interactive meeple. Okay, the Cosmic Horseshoe. This looks cool. So the first one was a view of the Hubble after it's released from the shuttle Atlantis. I guess it is really shiny. It is really shiny in this in this image. Whether or not it stayed that shiny. Except no casualties. The cosmic horseshoe is a distant galaxy magnified and distorted by the strong gravitational pull of the massive foreground luminous red galaxy at its center. This galaxy is roughly ten times the mass of our Milky Way. The image includes visible and infrared light image taken with Hubble's wide field camera 3. So part 2. Page 13, part (laughs) 2. Two hours in. The players awaken in the center of the largest city on Nexlaris, Eldestron. They retain all memories of their lives on Earth that are completely unfamiliar with the planet around them. They were transferred into the bodies of the characters they created, each with an intuitive knowledge of how to use either their magic or weapons. This can manifest through the fight at the beginning or other gameplay, but no knowledge of who they are on this world and will not recognize each other. This adventure opens in the equivalent of a bus stop, Use the following text to set the scene for your party. The equivalent of a bus stop. Oh. <laughs> uh, a bus stop station. Oh, well, actually, yeah, a bus stop. Not a bus station. The darkness fades around you, and you find yourself standing in front of what seems to be a portal, one of several in the bustling space around you. Something about this is familiar, like a bus stop on Earth. Each of the different portals around you has a walkway leading right up to it, and a sign hanging above, reading, Sarhelios, Besca Perea, Peleridon, Arkentnum. So these are like massive jumps, these ones. Hmm. Massive jump portals. You can surmise that each of these portals is leading to a different city. And as you take everything in, you see a sign high above in large lettering that reads, Welcome to Aldestron. The more you take in these strange yet somewhat familiar surroundings, you hear different languages as people walk and talk, different species you've never seen before. But more immediately, you realize you're standing in a group of people that all seem to be taken with the same confusion you're experiencing. As your fellow players look at you, what do they see? As the players take in their surroundings, people will continue to step around them, and they can overhear bits of conversation, including the following exchange. Oh, we made it just in time for supper. 
Let's go to the Horsehead Tavern. Great idea. I could use a pint and Damien's always had some kind of interesting story to tell. The two individuals walk by, unbothered by your presence as they head toward what you can assume to be the exit. Looking down the street, you see something like a cross between streetlights and lanterns hanging from poles down a bustling street. Further down, a broad sign hangs from a building showing a dark head of a horse on a field of bright red, along with a frothy mug. There appears to be a semicircle of people surrounding the door, and some loud shouting from both the door and the people looking inside. <laughs> yeah, it is... It's been a while since I've sat down and, and reread it, and I've never actually had anyone pull a silent or uh, I say that okay, I've never had anyone pull uh, a false hydra on me. I have had one pull a bit of a memory trick, <laughs> but uh, not not nearly that dangerous. More of a uh, not realizing that you already met someone uh, and that everyone around you also met this person. But you can tell, uh, well, I guess as a player, to prevent us from, like, in character, like, going through the same motion and through the same adventure again and again, I just kind of a, you, you guys feel satisfied with what, what has happened, even though you haven't met the person that you were chasing after. Uh, at least in some cases. If we had if we just not failed so badly in one spot, we would have been fine. We wouldn't have en almost entered a loop. Thank you for the water. <laughs> Actually, I should be moving that too. You're only getting one side of the hair. Oh, yeah, no. I didn't see the preview post. I only heard about this coming out a few weeks ago, like when it was uh, actually posted. But I did hear, I did see someone else, um, How Barn After Mimic Elf, did uh, review this last night. And he was going to potentially run it, but he determined that it was kind of too boring to run. <laughs> for chat, I guess. So that's why I just did a talk through. Uh, I, I read that on Twitter anyway. I didn't actually sit down to watch the, uh, watch his take on it. Yeah. Yeah. Not everything, not everything is a winner when it comes to the play itself. Like the concept behind it might be really interesting. I actually, trying to remember, I used to know a lot more about like certain mechanical interactions between objects because I did run a campaign for 5e and I was also a part of a game or a pseudo West Marches of sort uh, where we, we ran a lot of stuff. So I got more familiar with in weird interactions of things. Uh, I don't think we were playing when book of many things came out and i also am thinking book of many things when did that come out when did that come out uh let me see oh that was the wrong tab five e was that was that oh okay yeah 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 that's why because it was published after the um the December split. After the December split. <laughs> An opinion. Uh, so I actually... I haven't played d, &D in... I want to say... At least a year? 
if not maybe closer to two, because my group's been playing other games. Uh, so yeah, I don't have... I don't have Book of Many Things. Uh... I'd have to look up the, the more... I want to read the actual rules before I think about it too much more. And I don't have that. <laughs> because there are, like, weird rural interactions. <laughs> uh, okay, adventure begins. If they choose to wander around and look for signs of where they are, ignoring the disturbance around the tavern... Or try to tell people their situation. Use the first, next image. Of the following two sections. If they choose to follow the people into the Horsehead Tavern, use the second section. Both of these paths converge in the third section of part one. But yeah, so... I feel like... This is more of a module than it is a much else and most of those don't have a huge amount of options necessarily like they're they're almost never going to give like specific player options unless it's like a full-on book and like this is long for an adventure but <laughs> there's a lot of backstory to it uh, actually i'm gonna i'm gonna look at something really quickly where's my pile of things that i i was researching for when they were doing Adventurers League. Where's my Adventurers League folder? Fifth edition. AL. Uh, actually, they don't say how old they are. Uh, but it might also be the difference, actually, of tiers. Let me see if I got some. I don't have any tier three. Or rather, I don't have any tier 3 that I ran. But I have a tier 2. I've got a tier 2. Uh, wait. No, I didn't run any of these. I don't. It's been a little while. Let me see. Tier 1. Tier 1. Okay. This was a fairly simple... Fairly simple story. It was supposed to be like, I think maybe, yeah, it's two hour le for levels one through four. And it is 21 pages. <laughs> 21 pages, including like a couple pages at the beginning for things that are required for AL. Yeah, like three, four. About, like, five pages worth of... Six pages worth of stuff that's mandatory. So, like, 21 minus 6. 15, 15 pages of content, including uh, places, NPCs, uh, an extra madness chart, uh, and, like, magic items and some basic stat blocks at the end. So 41 pages... Like, 43 pages. This is kind of bloated, but it also might actually be because of the font size that they're using too. It feels like there's a lot, they're a lot bigger than I was, than I have for the previous thing. Let me take a look real quick, actually. Yeah. Yeah, wait, maybe if I do it this way instead. Let's do a, let me do a quick comparison. Yeah, it's also. The text size is different between between them, but I'm sure that's also a part of the nature of it being AL uh, proper content versus a. It is totally not seen. We're not going to say the word C and D, but you're all thinking it, and we're thinking it really loudly too. Yeah, they should have just made a. <sighs> what is it? Analog a hate story. That is something I would like to play with someday, but probably not on stream.
margin spacing is not terribly abnormal, I feel like. If the players look around the city, if the players choose to wander around to get a look at the city, they can come across the disturbance in the tavern or be questioned by guards who approach them due to acting suspicious. Another option is for players to roll a perception check. The players can roll a perception check, but as long as someone beats an easy DC, they can locate a bulletin board that tells happenings in the city. Use the following text. You find a bulletin board within this bus stop. There are some flyers posted to it. Some flyers look like they've been there for quite some time, but there are newer ones as well. One flyer appears to be a child looking for a lost pet. Another flyer mentions an upcoming festival that seems to be an annual celebration of lights put on by the local observatory. And the flyer in the middle of the board, pasted on top of some others, is about a reward offered for information about a series of presumed kidnappings. I know it's, it's for color, but at the same time, you know the players are going to be like, child, looking for lost pet, we have to help them first. Huh. At least I could have a potentially like, cut off of like, oh no, you see another copy of it later, like in another location as you're trying to find your way. And it turns out they found the pet happy ending. Skip it. Do not save the dog. The flyer about the disappearances points the players toward the city guard, saying to get additional information from the captain of the guard, Roxana Chaban. From this point, the players can easily locate a pair of guards on patrol and request to be taken to the captain to investigate. If players explore the city, they can see a number of buildings, with lamps scattered around the streets to keep everything lit. As they wander, they can pass various shops beginning to close beginning to close for the evening and smell delicious food coming from restaurants. People will be walking up and down the streets, talking amongst themselves. The players will hear glimpses of conversation about missing researchers. The players will be approached by a pair of guards asking if they're lost, as they seem to be out of place. Reading into their confusion, the guards will take them to see Captain Chabon. I am really thinking, too, like, man, this could be like if Kingdom Death settlements actually existed for longer than, like, 30 years, maybe. <laughs> Pipe dream. The pair of guards will take the players to the garrison while they'll, where they will wait outside until the captain is ready to see them. On the journey, the players will have the opportunity to speak with each other and the accompanying guard. This is a good time for roleplay among the players if the guards are walking ahead. If they choose to stay alongside the guards and converse with them, they have the opportunity to learn the following about happenings in and around the city, depending on how they steer the conversation. <laughs> it just reminds me of onesie in my head where it was a case of like, okay, uh, this is a scheduled three or three to four hour uh, session. Uh, I've got this timed out. You've got 10 minutes to role play. Go. <laughs> I'm going to interrupt at the 10 minute marker. <laughs> Captain Trebon has been sending patrols outside the city. They don't know why, but they do know most of the patrols haven't returned. They theorize the bandits who keep to the dark may be getting bold and the captain wants to avoid panic. He was honest. Uh, it was also, he didn't, he wasn't very, he was a very good tactician. Uh, and he didn't really care about RP. But he understood that we were interested in RPing amongst ourselves, I guess. So like, intra-party RP. Go off. There you go. Have fun. Um... <laughs> He's not going to be super involved in that. He doesn't have a, a horse in that race. But, like, it will affect some stuff down the road if we make some, like, big choices or something. Or if we suggest something that picks his interest. It will probably affect something later on. Uh, but he's not going to do... <laughs> Play a war game? Uh, I guess. He may have done that, too, but, like, he really loved D&D. You really love TNT. And the wacky shit it could do. 
he liked throwing hard things and he liked helping us build things that were uh i don't want to say broken necessarily but like some things that could be broken but like otherwise like really weird combinations to to make work and like uh could be broken but also throw hard things He was the one who set me up with a true binder. Gestalt. It was a Gestalt campaign, so everyone got that. But so that that's where we learned that, like, wow, wow, true namers. Ha <laughs> ha yeah. True namers. <laughs> I'm doing better. I'm doing better. <clears throat> Okay. There appears to be activity from the ruins outside the city, remnants of the civilization that existed before the breaking. The guards argue between themselves whether ghosts have come back to haunt the planet as they approach the anniversary of the breaking, or if some monster that emerged from the dark has gotten brave enough to approach the city. They're both confident that if the latter is true, the guard will make swift work of it. I'm not super well versed on Warforged because in a lot of the campaigns I've played or games that I've played, there's only really been like one Warforged. We tend to stick to... tend to stick to pretty basic... I feel like... Okay, I should specify. One group likes basic things. Ye old party of, of, uh, Facebook. <laughs> Facebook, it may be a little bit off of Facebook. Uh, and then back when AL had the rule of, um, you could choose one, I think, source book that wasn't base. Uh, I think that was it. I'm trying to remember. AL plus one or like, uh, <laughs> um, P player's handbook plus one, I think was the, was the thing at the time. I know they've opened up since. Uh, to prevent too many, like, I don't want to say breaking combinations, but, like, some, some like, OP shit. So you would not have been able to make your Warforged uh, with the with the item from, like, the most recent book, I feel like, depending on if you, how strict you're going. But also, I feel like, I guess that some of the DMs, the, one of the DMs did allow for a Warforged, or rather, like, someone actually wants to play Warforged, which might be the bigger hurdle. A few full arcane casters get options to young names from things they really shouldn't be able to. Uh, this was 3.5. This was 3.5. So it actually existed as a class. Um, and it was unironically like the worst class in the game. <laughs> I pair it was it was gestalted with um so it gestalt is like two, two classes leveled up at the same time. Um so I leveled True Namer and also Wizard at the same time, and Wizard was considered like one of the top tiers. Yeah, but it was 3.5 and not, like... <laughs> uh, uh, not DM Fiat, exactly. We play mostly by the book. There was, like, one or two instances where it was broadened. And damn. Damn. Okay, back to adventure. They've heard a rumor from a tavern called the Horsehead Tavern. The owner there, Felwyn, has been asking questions around the observatory. They don't say much, but players can quickly tell that they don't trust her, or the bartender Damien. If the players ask about the observatory, and the guards are quick to praise the research excellence, and the players can tell that the researchers across the planet are more or less in competition, each wanting to produce the highest quality of research and distribute it to the populace. 
If flares ask about disappearances, the guards become grim, lamenting that some of the finest researchers are gone without a trace. They each have their own theories, one believing that the criminal network is behind the assumed kidnappings, and the other believing that it has something to do with their research beyond, referring to the rumor that they've been borrowing data from another world. Huh. Just borrowing, yeah. Just a just an extra copy. No biggie, right? Speaking of which, I'm trying to remember uh, when something is. I know spring is coming up real quick. The first day of spring, depending on what calendar you follow. Uh, huh. That's weird. Huh. So I thought, so there's something called like World Backup Day. So it's kind of like, that would be three, that would be March 21st, right? Because three, two, one. And the answer is no, it's the 31st of March. Why? Why is it the 31st of March? Huh. <laughs> Don't forget to back up your data. Don't forget. Don't forget to back up your data. Yeah, right? <laughs> I wonder if it was, uh, I don't know, maybe they want you to actually have three copies in three different locations <laughs> or three different materials, three different materials of backups in three locations. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what the actual numbers are for. Okay. When they are taken in to see the captain, they say a tall, muscled, half-orc woman with visible scars across her face and arms. She has clearly seen battle. She is grim and serious as she tells them either about the disappearances, including that she has traced the trail to the forest outside the city, and believes there is something lurking in the ruins there, but the guards she sent to investigate haven't returned, or inquires about their suspicious behavior around the town. Use the following text to introduce the captain. Three copies, two on site, one off site. Okay, that makes sense. That that sounds right. I don't <laughs> know enough to, 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 to like <sighs> to contradict, but it sounds right. Uh, all I can think of is I don't. Hmm, hmm. I totally have three copies. Uh, oh, oh, so two different forms of media and one back up in a separate location. Okay. Yeah, tape. <laughs> Who would do tape? Uh... Yeah. Yeah. I've never physically seen a tape. Okay, I should specify. I don't actually know what the tapes look like. It's kind of like, do they mean, they don't mean VHS, right? <laughs> or like something like that. What the fuck does tape look like? No, not VHS? Okay. At least not, it's kind of a, at least not everything's going to be shoved onto the cloud, right? Just let, just let your data sit there somewhere. Captain Trebon welcomes you into her office, a stern-looking half-orc woman. She bids you all to sit down uh, before again seating herself behind a large wooden desk. Holding her hands together, she leans against it. Before speaking, she looks at each of you closely. <laughs> Hello, Pokediner. My guards tell me you're a bit out of sorts. Perhaps I can help. Taking each of you in, she continues... I believe it is entirely likely you're the individuals that were sent for, so I imagine coming here must be a bit of a shock. You're from Earth, I presume? If the players confirm they are from Earth, she will set up an immediate escort to the observatory, telling them that while she has very few details, she knows that they were brought here to help find a telescope that was taken from Earth, and she hopes their search for it will take them to the missing researchers as well. Mm 
Magnetic tape in space. Imagine. Okay, so I know that there's some anime that talk about, like, cleaning up debris in space. What? And also, okay, I just came back from seeing End of Ava. Sorry, sending tapes to space for that, for that extra separate location. The actual location not being on Earth anymore. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. That's the secret moon base. No, you can't use the moon base. No, no, no. You got to put it further out there. You got to put it further out there. I actually don't know how long it takes to get to the moon from, from Earth. I don't know what the average time is. What the average transportation time is. But I guess it doesn't really matter. But yeah, thinking about... Imagine... Okay, in a... In a world where there's, oh God, now I'm thinking like Wi-Fi in space. What, what would the life of a IT person who's supposed to do backups in, in like sci-fi space supposed to look like? <laughs> hmm. Hmm. NASA literally has part part of one of the three main space stations dedicated to data storage. Sorry. Huh. Huh. I didn't know that. Magical mirrors. The golden record. Oh, that's the one with the, uh, the people inscribed on it, right? All I can think of is you live you live on like a tertiary moon and the moon is literally just a storage place. <laughs> a storage colony for data. Imagine that. What is your life purpose? To to be storage. Although I suppose it's not literal. It's not like you literally are the storage. Although that could make an interesting hook for something, I'm sure. Storage and retrieval subsystem. Yeah, what's the thing is with that name, like storage and retrieval? I guess it depends on the, the definition of the word retrieval there, but it's kind of if you're storing something, you're probably hoping to retrieve it later, right? Physical raids on a tertiary moon to retrieve data tapes for a guy setup. <laughs> I'm sure there's also like some actual stuff that, that focuses on that too. Oh, actually, well, hmm. Hmm. Actually, shit. All I can think of is, wait, that's Rogue One, isn't... That's that's liter Shit, that's literally Rogue One, isn't it? Fuck. Okay. Shit. Um. <laughs> My bad. I... Yeah. Maybe your players won't realize that. <laughs> Just, just change the setting a little bit more. <laughs> uh, it makes me miss a little bit of a uh, hive. hive uh, sorry, scum and villainy. It makes me miss a little bit of scum and villainy. If the players ask about their disappearances, she will say they've been happening for weeks now. After the first, we assume Zyania Hask had simply gone to research in another city without informing anyone. But it wouldn't have been the first time. Well, then the others began going as well. Now four are missing. Well, they were working together on some projects. I don't know what. I would investigate further, but my guard is already stretched thin with the increased patrols. Uh, Scum and Villainy did not end exactly. Uh, it got put on the side because of, because of issues, like real life issues. Um, so we swapped to Worlds Without Number for, for a short bit and that ended. Like that had a more definite end. Like we could continue it, but more likely to start another campaign. Or like not campaign, like, uh, short campaign, I guess, like four to five session thing. 
Scheduling is hard. Scheduling is really hard. Yeah, no, Scum and Villainy was meant to be longer. We did, I think, two sets of missions, which should technically be one session each, but we we kind of stretch. So they end up being like two to three each. Yeah, scheduling is the worst. I just had the briefest thought of like, wait, today is Sunday, right? I mean, like, now it's Monday in the East Coast. But but today was Sunday. Because I realize I have something scheduled for tomorrow after movie night in the Discord. After movie night in Discord. Um, <laughs> and it was kind of a panic of like, wait, I didn't accidentally double book, right? No, I didn't. I've already accidentally double booked and like undouble booked a couple times this week for a few things. <sighs> no, I don't. I don't. I love you. That's that's why I'm doing the things, the extra things, the extracurricular things. <laughs> that's why I'm going to be doing a king, a basically a kingdom deathathon on my own. Actually, okay, you caught me. I am going to be going straight from Freerin to to playing a board game. <laughs> after, after that. <laughs> I'm going to be testing out a board game. One that's been out for like two decades. Three decades. God. Closer to three. Closer to three. Oh, uh, let's see, let's see. She doesn't know how or why whatever it is might be getting into the city, but she worries for everyone's safety and has been keeping a lid on the severity of this in order to prevent mass panic. She will ask the players if she can trust that they are up to the task. Captain Trebon will point the players to the observatory, providing them with the necessary papers to meet with the head researcher, Morgan Sherry. They will be given an escort to the observatory and will be taken directly to Sherry. Continue the adventure in the third section of Part 1. If the players choose to visit Horsehead Tavern and follow the rumors, continue it into the next page. I feel like they have a lot of duplicate information here that they could have culled down. For instance, they describe her like twice-ish in here. One is for the DM, but DM should already know that if they study the material. They just need to study their notes, damn it, because it's like basically all the stuff from in here, but a little less. And then they describe it for the, the block that's meant to be for the player's eyes or player's ears, which it'd be nice if they did like a little bit of indentation for that. But I can also understand that also eats into space. But usually uh, there is a little bit of a marker to let people know, like this is public information. This is private information. And also, the role playing Captain Trevon, it's kind of a wait, but shouldn't have bit that have basically been in the previous section when you gave the character notes? Uh, zero. Zero, ghoul. I have never been in a game that employed a false hydra, to my knowledge. To my knowledge. <laughs> Maybe we just failed that badly. I'm wondering if it was maybe edited by someone who didn't know. <laughs> Captain Jerbon is a gruff, or Captain Jerbon is gruff, straightforward, a no-nonsense character. She will make no effort to deceive the players and expects the same in return. As she sizes them up when they first enter her office, she is also gauging their trustworthiness and can tell if they are holding back information. If they withhold the information, she is wary of them and may not fully trust their motives. But she still desires to see the mystery solved, so she will point them to the observatory anyway. Just sending her guard with them along with orders to report anything suspicious. If the players ask about the Horsehead Tavern, the captain balks, not wanting to speak about Thalwin, Damien, or any criminal organization. She will tell them not to listen to rumors and that speed is paramount to rescuing the researchers, if they are still to be saved. The players can quickly surmise that her rough exterior covers a caring interior and that personality makes her an excellent guard captain. She desires at all times to see the city and the citizens under her care to be kept safe. <laughs> I 
If the players go to the tavern, use this excerpt to begin this section. As you walk along what looks to be the main street, you come along what appears to be a tavern. The sign hanging above the door reads, Horsehead Tavern. The exterior looks well kept, though it has been there for a while. Within the tavern, you hear the sounds of a commotion. People walking by the tavern give it a wide berth as they hear sounds of shouting inside. People who begin to approach often seem to think better of it, but a few still wander inside. As players walk into the tavern, they hear loud shouting, the last statements of an argument headed towards a brawl. What are you trying to say? No, it's goes from old Malkansa making our researchers disappear. That's nonsense. What really happened was the criminal underbelly of the city is getting out of control. Rampant kidnappings is what it is. You've seen how ineffective the guard is. No, no, no. The captain keeps sending the guard outside the city. That's where the trouble is. I'll bet my nose. There are some things I hear that are nice that I don't know. I don't remember if they come normally. Or maybe it's just the organization is different. For some of them, they might... Like, they front-loaded the NPCs. And in some cases, they backload NPCs and things. Uh... And, like, this is kind of nice. I don't know if it has to be so big, like, so much information, considering it's a repetition. Hmm. Hmm. But, I mean, like, it's not like AL are the pinnacle of being written, either, just because I remember how many notes I had to fucking write on that thing. Not to mention if there were any errors in them. At those words, a gnomish individual jumps on a table to punch the human who criticized the guard, sparking a brawl that soon includes a total of four combatants. The bartender will yell for the combatants to knock it off, probably not the first time since the fight broke out. Any perception or insight check will pick up that there is a lot of tension in the room, tensions that I also saw on the street, and a fight was bound to happen as the tensions roiled over. Broil boiled over boiled. If the players jump into the fray, roll a d4 to see how many are hostile toward the players, and use a standard guard stat to block for them. Or a standard guard stat block for them. Any characters engaged in the fight that are not hostile automatically flee when the player when the party gets involved. If players choose to join the fray, any NPC that falls below six hit points will flee. If players choose to speak with the bartender first, you will offer them free drinks in exchange for stopping the fighting, but express that any combatant should be let go. Any player that joins the fight will have muscle memory for using magic or weapons, giving them an opportunity to explore their new abilities. One thing is, standard guard stat block. Hmm, do they define that? That would be something that would happen in the end, let's see. Appendix A, B, C, nope. Just, just use the standard. I mean, that makes sense. It makes sense that they're not including anything because it's, <laughs> you don't even want to touch the, you don't even want to touch the, uh, the free stuff, the free supposedly good forever 5e stuff because what if they try and pull that same shit again thank you for the shrift thank you for the water too I'm almost out actually ah. welcome Boniface I should have expected I should have expected That really does suck, though. I could see when my mic picks up on that noise. I wonder, actually, if that's what I heard when I was doing my clipping. Huh. I couldn't tell what a certain noise was, and I'm wondering if it was that. Mm.
When the fight has ended, the bartender will walk over to the players. If they are questioning any of the combatants, he will encourage them to let them go. The bartender is a dark elven male named Damien, and he has a mid-white, mid-length white hair and a warm smile. If the players start asking questions about what's happening in the city, Damien tells them about the following, depending on the player's line of questioning. Tensions in the city have been running high since the string of kidnappings. Powerful researchers have been studying the cosmos at the local observatory, but one by one, they've been going missing. Some believe that the guards have gotten lax in their duties, and others that the researchers were careless. Everyone is reacting out of fear. It's made business slow down at the tavern, and he seems displeased by that, and mentions that the researchers may have gotten overzealous in their search for information, but won't elaborate further. There have been some rumblings from the guard that something may have taken up residence in the ruins of Moksana, but either doesn't know or won't say what he believes it is. As the players speak to Damien, he will thank them for their help with the fight, and ask if there's anything he can do for them. If the players want to go to the guard, Damien will encourage them not to worry about the fight. It happens all the time. If the players allude to their situation, he will take them to a back room to meet Failman, a tavern owner, immediately. He knows of Earth, mostly through rumor and knowledge that the researchers have been connecting with the planet to get information, information he learned from his work with Failman. But he is also aware that people from Earth were meant to be arriving in Aldstron, or Aldestron, to help find their missing telescope. If they don't allude to their situation, he will offer to set them up with some work, since they were helpful in the fight, and will still take them to meet Phelan. <laughs> yeah. I mean... Yeah. It's, it's also the fact that this is a government piece, so they probably have to be extra careful with things. Extra, extra careful. And this also already feels a little bit... I shouldn't say it already feels towing the line, but they probably had to do some, like, checking of things. Use the scene to introduce your players to the scene. Or use this to introduce your players to the scene. As you follow Damien to the back area of the tavern, he leads you into an office. It's a simple area, but houses a large desk, behind which is standing an elven woman with long blonde hair. Her back is to you, which she turns as you enter. <laughs> she smiles, but her guys are guarded, and she seems to be sizing, you e bleh, sizing each of you up with only a glance. Thank you, Damien. That will be all for now. She dismisses him with a casual wave of the hand. He nods and closes the door behind them on his way out. Phelan perches on the edge of her desk, folding her hands in her lap as she makes eye contact with each of you in turn. Phelan's eyes flare briefly as she casts a spell, a small smirk playing on her features as she looks over the players. Oh, you certainly aren't from around here, are you? Jumping planes takes some powerful magic. But transferring consciousness, well, that is something else entirely. I presume you're the ones we've been waiting on from Earth? Okay, when I read Jumping Planes, I misunderstood and I, I immediately jumped to, like, human planes. Not material or otherwise planes. Wrong, wrong sense of plane. <laughs> I was thinking aircraft. <laughs> Just kind of an eh. How does she know? How does she know what an airplane is? I know that they're doing research, but not that kind. And also initially, initial thought was, wait, if you guys have seen the latest Freerin, the, the blonde elven lady, the lady with long blonde elven hair in charge. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> That's just my mental image. That's my mental image. I also caught up on Dungeon Meshi. Looking forward to next week. For both, actually, because that should be the, I think, end of both of them. Last week is like the last week of the season, I think, in general. Because, because I just realized it's a changing of the seasons, of course, of course, of course, ish. Ish? Because it's not like winter, 
starts on winter. Now I think about it because the holidays, maybe. Fuck. Wait, hold on. Let me think. I wonder, I've never really paid attention exactly to the calendar of when things start. But just thinking like, wait, do things start after Golden Week then? <laughs> after the players have finished telling Failwin their story, she sits thoughtfully for a moment before responding. Those missing researchers, <clears throat> those missing researchers have the key to sending you home. They are connecting with your world, getting information from something called the Hubble Space Telescope. A few weeks ago, that telescope appeared to be erased from your timeline, which would take significant magic. The researchers were theorizing that it ended up here somehow, and to my knowledge summoned you all, people familiar with the telescope, to help find and return it. We tap into a powerful source of energy for our magic here, but none of us truly understands it. So they had no idea when you might arrive. They start then they started to go missing. I'll make the necessary introductions at the observatory, but I expect you all or I expect you to tell these researchers to pay me a visit when they get back. Of course, if you don't want to find them, I'm sure you'll enjoy spending the rest of your existence in our little world. Uh, I mean, this isn't researchers. Okay, I guess she was a researcher once upon a time. I did mention that. I feel like she's a bit of a prepared wizard, though. Sorry, I mean, I'm probably mispronouncing her name wrong, too. I read it. I, I don't really think about how it's pronounced. I also know that, oh, German, oh, fuck, I, I've mispronounced Freer for the longest time, too. The delivery of the last line sounds vaguely like a threat. During the conversation, her posture, no matter whether or not the characters are forthcoming, indicates a baseline distrust, and if any of the players try to cast a spell, she immediately counterspells them. She asks them questions about where they come from and if they know anything about Hubble. She takes notes of their responses, folding a paper and placing it off to the side. At the end of the meeting, she writes a brief letter and encourages them to ask to see the head researcher at the observatory, giving them the sealed document. Proceed to the next section. Uh, if the player decides to go to the guard at this point, they can easily locate a guard and explain this for their situation, at which point they will be taken to the captain. So go back a page. <laughs> Role playing Damien. Damien is more kind and more trusting than Failwin, but there's a reason they've been working together for decades. Having once been a hopeful young student, he still envies the position of the leaders of the world, but he's content to be the right hands of Failwin, for now. He hopes to one day still, com still complete his study, and he has a hunger for any knowledge that comes his way. If something reaches his ears, it's highly likely that it will be known by Failwin as well but he is far easier for the characters to be friends and will offer a drink in exchange for interesting facts or stories of adventure. We're all playing Failwin. Failwin is a fickle character. She doesn't trust anyone except for perhaps Damien, and that isn't a secret. She has an extensive network across the world, some researchers she used to work with in the wake of the breaking, and some that have come to seek her help or advice. She has no desire to be known, so she sticks to the comfort of her tavern, Failwin trades and favors. If the party asks for something of her, if the party asks something of her, she will want something in return. Even if that is just a favor she can choose at a later date. Her cold disposition is what players will get from her, but a sharp mind holds a keen interest in any information she can get her hands on. However, she isn't the most trustworthy of characters. Her mood can shift quickly depending on player actions. Either she is an ally or she can't be bothered. Valen's art is subtlety. This is a character that will very rarely show her hands. Unless this is leading up to something that kind of, uh, how to put this? Unless this is leading up to some trick that's even hidden from the DM at this stage. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Image is cute, but again, like, uh, actually that might just be filler space. 
It's kind of annoying that it's in here and not at the end, though. Visiting the observatory. As the players approach the observatory, they'll see a group of buildings arranged in a spiral going outward from a central courtyard. A stone sign near the arch marking the entryway reads, Orion Observatory and Museums, and the letters look like shining stars. Players can surmise this is some form of enchantment. Lamps keep all the walkways well lit, and if they were to see it from above, they may think it looks somewhat like a spiral galaxy. All the buildings are gray stone that matches the walkways in between them, and the courtyard is lush with bushes and a large tree sustained by powerful lamps. As they look for the head researchers, or head researcher, they'll be directed to the largest building on the other side of the courtyard, a massive dome-shaped building. So, depending on where they're coming from, let's see. I might start skipping some boring parts. <laughs> okay. Yeah, like, coming from Captain, it doesn't really matter, I feel like, if they come from the Captain or if they come from the horse head, do they? How's the module? Uh, <laughs> a little, I don't want to say strangely written, but this is something, a sentiment that's come up a couple times from people. Uh, it, it doesn't quite feel like it's written from someone who knows how a game plays out a little bit. I think it's kind of repetitive in, in spots. Uh, it's uh, not exactly, but I mean, it's okay. Look, it's a module. Most of them are pretty railroady. I think the most extensive module I've seen in terms of options uh, let me grab that one out that I, that I uh, saw. Uh, I remember Bane of the Tradeways was kind of crazy, theoretically, because um, you actually had, like, four paths to take, I think, in a 30-page module. Let's subtract, like, six again, so, like, a 24-page module. It's a fairly short, though, um, because it's mostly just a... Actually, was it three? Nope. Uh, yeah, three. Three options. Uh, that affects, like, how things kind of split. And they even have a little chart in part of it. Uh, let me see. Where's the chart? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, no? No. So, like, do you help... Uh, you are... You come across some people fighting. Who do you side with? Pretty much. And that, like, affects the path. In a major way. In that story. This one doesn't have that. It's pretty much, uh, here's like two things that you could do in the city that you might follow. Um, it's a, it's a government product. Actually, it's NASA. <laughs> they have to, it's, it's, it has to follow government rules and they're probably uh, one. They don't want to expressly label it D and Z because that's not how it works. Even if you are a, I want to say, even for most things that are published and making money, they don't want to expressly label D and Z because then they have to follow certain rules. Like I don't want to say sub licensor; that's not the right terminology. But like, there's there's uh, interactions going on that they would have to adhere to. Uh, out of the abyss. Um, let me let me check what what it was. Let me see. Um, I have got the number. It's a DDEX35. Uh, from 2015. I, I only, uh, picked it out because it was something that was relatively short. Um, and it seemed interesting because it was... <laughs> because, again, you could, you could follow the obvious path, but you don't have to follow the obvious path. There were options for the rest. But because it's AL, again, people are going to assume, oh, I'm supposed to help the, the good-seeming people and not the shitty people. Um, I can probably actually... I do still have... I have one of the old uh, catalogs. Let me check the 9 catalog. Let me check the 9 catalog real quick. Season zero, author only, author only, blah, blah, blah. Season two, elemental evil, rage of demons. Uh, 
Uh, yes. It is a intro thing for Out of the Abyss. Yeah, yeah. So actually, I think I ran like... I ran two of those. I ran Bane of the Tradeways and I ran No Foolish Matter. <laughs> it was interesting. Yeah, this is it's supposed to be system agnostic. Uh, so they, they never say DNZ. They don't give you a guard stat block, but they say use a standard guard stat block for this. Uh, and there's no... There's some guidance, like this should be an easy DC. This should be a hard DC. Things like that, too. But they don't give exact numbers. Let's see. I don't know if they're going to be doing an advanced thing later. It might depend on what the reception to this was, which might be a case of like people who don't know D&D. Oh, it's really cool. Get them into science. If it's people who are into D&D, they'll be like, yeah, I'll just steal some shit. I'll just steal some stuff for this for my home campaign. Some concepts. Isn't that the way it goes? <laughs> Literally talking about like, oh yeah, I remember uh, this this other module. I, I took some stuff from a home game. Like, yep, yeah, that's that's the way, brother <laughs> or sister. Just just take, give nothing back. Uh, let's see. Let's see. No, you're not, you're not even supposed to have like, you're supposed to pay for each AL, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're supposed to, I totally bought each and every AL I ran. <clears throat> Considering I wasn't part of any official AL uh, group. Like, uh, I know that there's also rules for like running AL. So like I did not, I did not, uh, work in one of those official ones. Yeah, local game stores. Hmm, yeah. I I totally frequent those. And don't just order things online. Okay. So, we have speaking to the head researcher. As you enter the office, you can see it's an extension of the library you just walked through. Books crowding the shelves on every wall and every other surface in the room. Amid all these books, you see a single figure, a tall human with long hair, gray streaks running through it, on the top of a ladder retrieving a book from a high shelf. As you approach, you can hear the person muttering quietly, unaware of their surroundings. Their assistant, who led you through, through clears their throat, and the person on the ladder turns. Oh, terribly sorry. I didn't see you there. As this figure scurries down the ladder, they adjust their glasses. Unusual to have visitors at this hour. What can I help you with? <laughs> when the players tell them about their arrival from Earth, they're keenly interested. Da, 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 da. No choice. Find me. Find, get me that telescope. Get me that telescope. Get me pictures of that telescope. Mm. Uh, yeah, and then tea and cookies. The, yeah. I Okay, it also might depend on what kind of group that you run, because I could totally see that being some this mattering to some groups and to other groups. It's pretty much info dump. Info dump. We're done. Of course, Eric was mortified when Hubble went missing in your timeline. Such a terrible loss for your world. Though well, maybe it is false, but I no longer think that's the case. He suspected it ended up somewhere in our world, which is why he sent for you all. I'm sorry it was such a shock for you, but you all know. Knew the telescope so well. We thought you might be able to find it. If it was our fault, 
You have our sincerest apologies. We want to see this spectacular invention return to where it belongs. It has been a great benefit to both our worlds. We would never rob yours of that. Yeah. I'm not here for I'm not here for tea and cookies. They straighten their glasses, like for when the researchers what they were studying. Hmm, I believe there are some papers lying around here. They spend a moment rummaging through some loose papers on their desk, and they look pleased when they find the ones they're looking for here. Here we are. They quickly return to their seats and spend a moment thumbing through the papers. The researchers have been connecting with another world across planes recently. And I'm not certain what you recall of Hubble. It's a very powerful and useful telescope from your world, or at least a version of the one you know. And it makes some rather impressive observations. Not everything applies exactly, of course. But being, being different planes of existence. But there are some things that can be rather useful. Actually, it may be better to show you the researcher's office. He keeps a great deal of information there. I have to admit, I actually, I feel like I know where that's from, but I've never seen it. I know it's referenced in a lot of places, but I, I, I don't know what it's originally from. They live. Is that the name of it? I've never seen it. But I feel like that might be common for a lot of people who <sighs> are alive now. They only know the references. I only know the references, the, 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 the mimetic, the mimetic replications of the original. The head researcher leads you through the ser a series of stone hallways, some busy with people looking at exhibits, others much quieter. Ah, here we are. A great deal of information in here, obvious, and not so obvious, they say as they unlock and push a wooden, open a wooden doorway. How about this? This is something that I saw. Something I saw. I'm going to double check. I need to do some quick math. Hold on. Wait. I don't even have... The Matrix. The Matrix is going to be 25 years old in like two weeks. The Matrix is going to be 25 years old. Uh, and also apparently a lot of, uh, uh, there's a, I think if you try and sit down like an 18 year old or something to watch the matrix, it, I don't, I don't think it's going to stick very well. <laughs> Supposedly it's not very, it, it doesn't hold up, I guess, to newer generation, the newer generation. So, so your, your matrix references will not land. Your matrix references will not land. I, okay, I should specify they will land with me, half and half. I have seen the matrix. I did not walk. I did not finish the animatrix, and I am not. Oh God, I'm not. A, I'm not generation alpha. Is it? Is that the like lowest one now ish? Yeah, actually, yeah. Jay's right too. I have to think about that too. <sighs> People not realizing some things. There was something else that was just kind of funny. Oh, right. Someone, this is something that was very strange because I've actually been there um, around that area a couple times. The World Trade Center area in New York City. Someone took a photo and they were like, why is there a mall here? Why is there a mall underneath the World Trade Center? Like where, where you know, the towers fell and stuff. Why? A mall. That doesn't feel right. That feels wrong. And and the answer was there were a lot of answers, and there there are a lot of answers. And the answer is one, it's not under there. It's not under there. <laughs> Two, it's it's also a substation. It's not a substation. It's a, a transportation center area. And three, well, I guess like three, four, five, sort of. A trade center was a trade center. There was already a mall there. So they're just like rebuilding something in kind of like the same like concept. 
<laughs> and another thing is just like people gotta people gotta move, people gotta eat, people gotta shop, yo. <laughs> the entire the entire area, like how how far out do you want this no commerce zone to be? <laughs> how far out do you want it to be? And honestly, I mean I've been there. I don't I don't, maybe my memory is just so bad. I don't remember seeing it so close. And like, you don't, when I was there, it was kind of, th there's the mall. And, and then like the, the, the memorial and the museum felt quite separate. Also, it was a humongous, humongous, humongous uh, escalator, I believe, <laughs> to get down into the mall or something like that. Or maybe that was for the, for one of the transportation methods. Just, and also the fact that like she she may or may not have been alive when when the towers fell. So it's just sort of a oh, right. People are just gonna okay. People don't. People aren't old enough to remember. <laughs> That's fine. I I I was up. I've gone up. I went up the towers. Before they, before they fell at one point, at least once. It's a very famous spot. Was a very famous spot. You know, do the Statue of Liberty, maybe the Empire State Building or the World Trade Center or something. One of the one of those two. <laughs> for all the for all the uh, visitors to the area. <laughs> elevators, though. So many fucking elevators. The last taxi out. Mm hmm. I was going to say, how long? And it's kind of a wait. 20, so it's like 23 years. The news, the news broadcast when you were over in the US for a visit. Uh, yeah. Uh, I... Mm, how I heard was indirectly. <laughs> how I heard was indirectly. Uh, mm, Rumors go around. Rumors go around when you're not able to see news directly. Okay. So beyond the doorway is a well-lit room. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. So we have... What's, what's important in this room? Okay. A projection off the desk. Oh, okay. I thought you meant like you were at your grandma's in the U.S. I misunderstood that. Sorry. Mm. The researcher had been studying how the energy of the vacuum may be the cause behind the quickening expansion of the universe. That's why he had been connecting with Earth in hopes that you know more than we do. He thought that may also shed some light on why our magic doesn't always go exactly as we would intend. This energy, you see, isn't always the most stable to tap into. He thought that by looking at this particular phenomenon, globular clusters... Globular? Globular. I'll still say globular. It's a little bit more difficult, but... Globular clusters. You may be able to pick up some information. This particular projection has been altered in some way. The coloring is different from when I last saw it. It was more red last I saw it. Wait, or was it bluer? This thing changes so often it's hard to keep track. At any rate, there's an adjustment here. They indicate a round knob that turns either clockwise or counterclockwise. Wavelengths. Blue means hotter and younger. Red means cooler and older. Huh. I wonder where green falls. I I wonder where green falls. Probably closer to blue. 
Actually, wait, it's not really on that spectrum. Never mind. It's on like another side. <clears throat> color. Well, actually, color light. Fuck. RGB. It's in. It, never mind. It's not. It's like, yeah. Never mind. It's not even in the equation. <laughs> as far as I know. I'm not a science. There's a, there's a reason why I don't normally do science RPGs. <laughs> Less than, greater than. Uh-huh. If the player is asked to shift the image more into a blue wavelength, they will see a message written in the stars. Hubble found. If they shift the image into red, they will see, go to Moxana. As they shift between wavelengths, some of the stars seem to get fainter or disappear. NASA nerds. Speaking of which, if you're interested in space stuff coming up uh, April 8th, which I believe is a Monday. Let me double check. Yeah, April 8th is going to be a, a, a total eclipse. Total solar eclipse. So, um, yeah. If, if you have the chance to go see it, I would suggest you do so because it's not going to be... If you're in the U.S., I should say. It's in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in the U.S. Uh... If you're in the U.S., worth checking out, probably. And I'm going to be on break for that time, too, because I'm going to be checking it out. Says the person who's not into science -y shit. <laughs> reading a science mod- uh, reading a NASA module for, for a fantasy role-playing game. Mm, if the players inquire about globular clusters, Shari will explain that they are tightly gravitationally bound clusters of tens of thousands, perhaps millions of stars with the largest concentration of those stars being in the center of the cluster. Okay, big picture. If the players ask why the researchers are using data from Hubble instead of their own orbiting telescopes, they will explain because of the nature of the shields around their planet, they don't have the atmospheric interference Earth experiences, and therefore no reason to put telescopes into orbit. They simply find Earth's knowledge to be useful in their study, and their orbiting telescopes are interesting ideas. They will explain that before the breaking, they had observatories in mountains and deserts, but now they are able to see the cosmos from anywhere. Reference the adventure background section for the explanation on the breaking. So basically, lore dump. Lore dump. Earth as a study of what Exlaris could have been. Uh, sort of, but also at the same time, not really, because I want to say magic throws a wrench in some of this. Magic throws a wrench in some of this. So, like, the concept of a rogue planet is interesting. It's basically more so, like, man, these would be really interesting kernels for a another game. These are interesting kernels to steal. Let's... <laughs> uh... What what's the name of a corn holder? I mean, like a big grain mill, like a grain mill full of corn. Let's just steal some kernels. Let's just walk off with some chunks of corn. Once the puzzle has been solved and discussed, the headmaster will wonder what else may be hiding in the professor's office. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mentioned this before, but Halbernacht, the mimic elf, um, was looking through this yesterday. I didn't listen in. Uh, because I was drinking and putting together furniture. But uh, from his Twitter post, he didn't think it was worth running for chat. So so he was just reviewing it. Uh, my monitor. My monitor stands. I got a monitor stands for, for two monitors. So I have more space for cats. Unironically, more space for cats. I just have to prevent them from hurting themselves on the cords now. And I got a new mouse that is wireless. I'm going to try and actually make it wireless so I, I can avoid having cats, like, do bad stuff. I'm still going to have to plug it in occasionally to charge, but I'm hoping to get into a good... I had a wireless mouse before, I just never really did it wirelessly. <laughs> never used it wirelessly. And it even came with stickers! It came with stickers to put on it. 
Which I also drunkenly applied. It looked pretty decent. Uh, they're meant to be like grip tape. Serious gamer mouse. Serious gamer mouse. That seems like it's going to be pretty durable. Actually, uh, maybe I shouldn't say durable. Like, It looks like it'll hold up except for battery. But I don't know what can be done about that. Microwave. <sighs> the microwave. Eventually. Yep. Hire someone to install it. So the puzzle is... Shifting the lights. Shifting the lights. Uh, if they want to investigate the office, they can spend a half hour and make a medium DC investigation check. So things like that. Not specifying number. Note. Okay, so we have notes on the energy of the vacuum. Model of the Hubble Space Telescope. The headmaster will explain that the professor theorized it had a modular construction so it could be easily repaired and upgraded in orbit. The players can take apart this model and look at various components. This would be really cool in person. <laughs> oh, actually, that would probably be pretty cool for like an escape room thing, too. Not going to happen, though. A book on historical Earth astronomers and physicists. Physicists. Including Nancy Grace Roman, Lyman Spitzer, and Edwin Hubble. Information on each of them as follows. Oh, so here they're doing dumps of information. Learn. Okay, I'm not going to read this. Um, <laughs> but here's... So, sorry, um, Brother Miles. There, there's info dumps on famous astronomers and physicists. You guys, you guys have to like space to be playing this one. <laughs> uh, as the players speak with Sherry, they also mention a strange figure that had been visiting the observatory, seemingly an elf, but something slightly off about them. This figure hadn't been seen around since the last disappearance. They had visited with all the researchers. They're suspicious. None of their friends or various contacts know anything about them. Uh, duh, duh, duh. Shh. Look, I'm not the only green elf around. They're also not an elf. You don't have to be part plant to be green. Okay. If the players ask about the ruins outside the city, they will tell them that the ruins are of the former capital city of Exlaris, Moxana, which turned to chaos and was ransacked and left to ruin in the wake of the breaking. It had once been a truly grand city, but it had been fully left behind as the world moved into its new era. They mention that there is still a full library there, though they lament that some of the books are probably no better than dust after so many centuries. The only thing preventing them from trying to get to that knowledge are the creatures that have made homes in and around the ruins. They say it's a dangerous place to go. Ah, uh, let's see. I feel like this is reiterating information that we already had before, too. Uh, Role-playing! Thanks, this is duplicate information. Yeah, that's fair, too. It's a little different when you're reading it for the first time versus when you're doing an actual play. I do know that I, when I made mine, or when I was making notes on stuff, I would basically like reshuffle some information so that I would have notes as I was going. You would think. You would think. I don't remember how I heard about it. I actually don't super remember. I could probably look back at my Twitter timeline <laughs> to see where I got it from. Uh, although I may have heard it from a space head. I don't actually know if that's what they call themselves or if they're called that, but just someone who, who very much likes space. 
Okay. If they pursue the elven figure, if the players decide to decide to pursue a line of questioning about the elven figure, they can ask Sherry's assistant for more details. They wander in and out of the city alone instead of using a portal to reach another city, uh, which is extremely dangerous. So they may hear that they were heading west last with a medium DC check. Uh, the last individual who Eric has in, one of the missing researchers, was seen with before he disappeared. And they may have gone westward into the ruins. We're like at page 24. <laughs> Heading for the ruins. If the players still share they intend to make for the ruins, they will pale and ask if they are sure that they want to undertake such a journey. Yep, they do, because they're adventurers. Uh, let's see. Old com They have old computers. Or rather, they look like the old computers on Earth. Arcane computers. Because I'm skipping. I'm skipping ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a... Um, NASA put out an adventure, and I can link you the adventure right here real quick. I feel like I should have put that as, like, information. I should have attached it to a... a Bang game commands. But I keep forgetting to update that. It's not updated. <laughs> I don't remember last time I updated it. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. It's more of an interest piece than it is an actual playable piece. Maybe. Unless you want to rip some stuff out of it and shove it into another another scenario, maybe. Then again, considering how there, I've had some games where it's like, okay, uh, we'll, we'll get through this module in like three hours, right? And then six fucking hours later. It's kind of a, maybe it's better if they say three to four hours and there's literally only like three scenes. <laughs> or rather, three to four scenes, maybe? I guess we'll see. It's a promotional piece. It's a promotional piece. Sherry again uses a spell to activate a projection in the middle of the room. This particular technology may help. It uses something called a grav it uses something called gravitational lensing to get a better look at things around us. We usually use it to look at other stars and planets. We can be turned to our own world instead or as well. Gravitational lensing occurs when the Gravity of a massive cosmic object distorts space and time, magnifying and bending the path of light coming from beyond it. Let's see further, as though using a lens. Our magic allows us to simulate this effect. They wave their hands and the projection clears, showing the woods outside the city and the ruins within them. This is the epitome of sufficiently advanced technology is no different for magic. <laughs> They're using magic to recreate advanced technology. Damn, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So more talk about gravitational lensing is appendix A. You know what? This might also be a case of how can... I can imagine, like, there might be some science teacher out there who is about to lure some, some like, teenage nerds to play this game. Look, look, d and isn't of the devil. Look, NASA put this out. We're learning about science. Except then again, okay, never mind. I just realized a fatal flaw in my, in my description there. Trying to convert people who think that d and is the devil through science. Science-based module. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I um, I didn't think that one through. My bad. Uh, <laughs> it might work on some people. It might work on some people. Some parents. Or, yeah, yeah. It might help in some lesser cases. Okay. Okay. 
This lens can help determine the best path to the ruins. Uh, ruins appear hazy. So they give them a device. So they get a mini gravitational lens. It will reveal traps along their route or the answer to a puzzle, depending on the path they take. There's only enough energy to use it once. One free pass. Greater healing potion, just in case. And a map. Everyone needs luck. Uh, so we do actually also have a map. It's extremely basic. <laughs> this is Appendix D. Yeah. Oh, you can't see the entire thing. Let me zoom out a tiny bit. <laughs> Go in. Go in. I can kind of make it work a little bit more too. Temporarily. Uh. <laughs> kind of like this. Kind of like this. It's honestly, depending on what the adventure is like, it's probably absolutely fine. Considering we're probably mostly done with it. The adventure itself. The thing is, it's actually more it's, making a map that looks that decent. Can be a little bit time consuming. It's just the content of it is pretty simple. But it has a decent presentation. Which honestly is a lot of the difficulty. Mm, okay. Okay, so this is a descript this is a image that shows how gravitational lensing works. Huh. Huh. Hmm. And also the link to learn more about gravitational lensing. Ooh. Pretty picture. <laughs> so this is a view of a galaxy cluster. So actually, you know what? This is a promo piece. In, I mean, we knew it was a promo piece for the Hubble telescope. But again, like, even more heavily... This is, here's all the cool shit that we've been doing with the Hubble in the 34 years or so that we've been working with it. James Webb Telescope. I feel like I probably, wait, depending on how recent that is, probably not very recent. I may have seen photos, I just don't remember the names. Okay, so this, that was part one. We covered part one. Oh my gosh, okay. Path your players take converge at the edge of the city. Okay. So the first one was the uh, <laughs> RP section, and this is probably the section where it is more about actually doing stuff, right? Different puzzles for different paths the players may choose. Uh if the puzzles are proving too difficult for the players, one of the researchers can escape and act as a guide to help move the story along. Uh, if they attempt to cast detect magic above ground in the ruins, they will get a similar effect to the one they saw through the gravitational lens of the observatory. Hazy. There's magic. But not exactly what. Seventeenth century uh, cartography and pirates that Photoshop brushes carry hard. I haven't I haven't gotten those Photoshop brushes. I I am a Pixabay and Pexels kind of person. <laughs> of course, there's also some other things, some other sources too, but just <sighs> oh oh, and uh, there's another site, Incarnate. God, Incarnate, <laughs> free Incarnate. Um. For those who don't know, Incarnate is a website where you can build maps. Uh, let me see. 
Yeah, but Incarnate is kind of useful, was kind of useful at the time. Um, this was years ago, where it's... <laughs> I don't need an actual map-making tool. This is a fantasy map-making tool. That's close enough. It's close enough. I'm not going to super heavily worry about whether or not this mountain range looks natural or not. Also, um, when it comes to like battle maps, I have actually got, I paid for, I was a Patreon of, or I was a patron, I should say, I was a patron of some map makers. So I got some, I have a lot of materials that can be used to put together battle maps. I ironed that out for myself. Yeah, I went a little too, too, too deep into that. I like pretty battle maps. Or rather, I should say accurate battle maps. Like, the images themselves don't have to be good as long as they represent, they are very clear. Like, this is, this is a tree. This is a, a table. Uh, there's a piece of paper that is actually important on the table. If it's not important, it may not be there. If it's not something you can actually interact with. Messing with battle maps... I did. I did do. But some of them were more hand-drawn than others. Mm. Let's see. In the distance, you can see one of the only tall structures that survived the destruction of the city and time that has passed since. This remnant of a tower was once the prison now roughly half its original height, poking out like a grave over a sea of shale and rock. Beyond the tower, you can see a partially ruined massive building with shattered columns and large stairs leading to long, rotted doors. This was once the library that head researcher Sherry spoke of. Around those buildings are numerous other mostly fallen structures, but those two seem most complete. These structures are scattered across a large radius, seemingly mostly buried under a landslide from long ago. The tower seemed partially buried, marking the boundary of the passable city ruins. Uh, ruins can be explored, but little be found. Looted or withered away. So you can choose one of two buildings, basically. The tower or the library. The players may climb up the hill toward the prison tower, enter through a window, and descend. Once inside the crumbling remains of the prison tower, you look around and take in the failing walls around you. Long, bent, and rusted bars of a prison cell left open where you now stand. There's a partially ruined staircase leading down, but it looks passable. You can't tell from this angle exactly how deep it goes. Uh, so you can go down to a tunnel. Oh, there's a puzzle. Okay, here, here we have a puzzle. We have a puzzle, you guys. <laughs> uh, as they reach the base of the stairs, there's a landing with two arches. One is covered with a wall of blue flame and the other a wall of red flame. Players may remember the wavelengths of light from earlier in the game. If they use that knowledge, the blue wavelength means something is younger and hotter, and red means cooler and older. Red is the correct path, and the players will be able to pass through the flame unharmed as long as they don't linger within the flame. It's not a Bobby puzzle. You can't just enter Bobby. Also, also, I um I saw a <laughs> I saw, I think, a website that was supposed to be all of the clues and stuff for, for Neverhood because I wanted to see if I missed a puzzle very specifically. They they thought the answer was booby. They called it the booby puzzle. The answer was booby. I, I, I do not know if it was a 
a joke error or if it was a a honest error. Uh, there, to explain a bit better, there, there's a puzzle in a game I just played and you have to enter in an order of light passing through crystals of color. Or you have to have a laser of light pass through five crystals of color and there's it's written Bobby outside and you have to enter in Bobby and crystal, which is blue, orange, blue, blue, yellow. Yeah, Photoshop. Photoshop's a hell of a drug. Photoshop is a hell of a drug. <laughs> if players use the gravitational lens at this point, they will see that red is the correct path, uh, and they can see that the researchers are being held but alive in the chamber at the end of the path. Only 1d6 fire damage is not too bad for the for the blue flame. Especially because this is a this is a a tier uh, two, I think. Like, it's level th 7 through 10, right? 1d6 is nothing. If they do the library... Uh, let's see. You ascend the few large stairs into the library. No, I think it's supposed to be higher. Seven... Four to seven, level 7 through 10. Level 7 through 10. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's and, and four to seven players at that level. That's something to sneeze at. That's a that's a pretty decently powered party. Most campaigns don't make it past like what fifteen. Like fifteen is like a high high boundary. Unless you're doing like a straight, like a, a level 21 shot or something like that. <laughs> I feel like a lot of other ones just end at like 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wonder, it's, it's a young green dragon though, but depending on if it's only a young green dragon, then it might still yet yeah, be a case of like, well... You could throw some harder stuff at them beforehand. But then again, we've only barely touched into the into the uh eating resources part of the of this module. Cause the 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 first part didn't eat any resources whatsoever. In fact, it gave you resources. It gave you resources. You ascend the few large stairs into the library, looking around as you see some massive shelves still standing, with books remaining on them through though some scattered are though some scatter at their base. Other shelves are toppled over, and still more books are scattered across the floor. There are books all around. This was once a grand library that had been left at time. As you make your way through the shelves, there seems to be a path through the rubble, sometimes wide enough for only a person to pass through, sometimes much larger. For some reason, it appears that most of the books this library could have housed are still here. If the players take a moment, some are newer than others. Far too new to have originally been a part of the library because they absolutely know how long it's been since the, uh, since the break, the breaking. Yes. We might have actually skipped that part. They might know. Uh, let's see. Let's see. You can find your way back through the library. Uh, the door is closed, but not locked. and seems newer. The path they follow leads them to a wall that's been painted over with a mural. The fate of the mural still shows a globular cluster similar to the one that they had seen in the researcher's office, brought into focus with a larger scale gravitational lens than they had seen at the observatory. 
the character will be able to, or the characters will be able to draw the connection between the two. If they hold up the lens Sherry gave them to help see more clearly, they will discover that this is an illusion blocking a stairway below. This image is the Rings of Relativity image located in Appendix E. If the players do not use the lens, they will still be able to discover that the wall is an illusion if they try to touch it or step through. Huh. So this is just, I'm going to show you guys art and you better appreciate it. Oh, and also here's the map. Okay. Yeah, this is this is a hundred percent like getting getting the kids interested in science through D and D. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. Science is cool again. Yeah, it is. It is making an attempt. <laughs> Actually, I could see, like, that could be a project for a student to, like, can you make something that make make a make a puzzle? Oh my god. Imagine being a teacher who also is, like, a DM or something. Getting your students to help you design puzzles. <laughs> Science puzzles! Or using your students as test dummies for those sorts of puzzles. Although I feel like that would backfire. Because, honestly, if your players are not using it, they, they might kind of lose it in terms of, like, science stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no shit. It depends on if you're also maybe already known as, like, the D&D &D teacher. The D&D the &D club teacher. Yeah, well-paying teacher job. Right, right, right. Oh, I guess it might depend on what country you're in. Uh, let's see. Well paying, well paying. I see, I see, I see. If the players step through it, they will see the stairs, the same age as the ruins, leading down into a tunnel. There are some fallen stones in the way, but it's fairly easy, passable terrain. Mm. Uses text to set the scene. As you walk, you come to a large metal door. It's new, and beside it, a lit torch. Someone's been here recently. If the players do not check for traps or fail a medium DC investigation check, the door opens and six arrows shoot out of the wall at the end of the hall. Uh, D20 to determine how many arrows hit. Right, because that's totally how it works. Uh, huh. This is a little wibbly, but that's okay, I guess. Arrows have existed for a long time. Forums, my man, forums. Use this text. Oh, wait, actually, so 1d6 for the arrows. So that might kind of be... Party, they say party member is closest to the door, so I guess that's kind of like DM question, as many as they want. Mm. Oh, distributed at GM discretion, whoever they want to fuck with. I was just thinking about RSS feeds the other day, and it was kind of a... I miss my web comics delivered by RSS feed. I I miss my web comics delivered by RSS feed. Uh, 
Okay. The large chamber. Ooh, 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 ooh. <clears throat> As you enter the circular stone room, you first see stacks of books piled on every surface. The air is chilled and musty. Beyond the books, your eyes are immediately drawn to a telescope the size of a school bus. A telescope you recognize as Hubble from the likeness you found at the observatory. It doesn't seem to be functioning at the moment. The books in this room appear to be much newer than the ruins all around. The room is dimly lit and otherwise largely empty, save one figure. As they turn, they appear to be elven. It could be a trick of the light. You see a faint tinge of green to their skin. You're not guards. The figure approaches, their movement almost stalking, predatory. Brave little adventurers. You've made a grave mistake coming here. The elven figure will reveal themselves to be called Asilius and repeatedly reference their horde in a brief conversation with the players, telling them that they can neither, neither have the researchers nor the precious knowledge they hold. Look, it's a male dragon! <laughs> It happens to be taking a elven form, not the same. Asilius insists they alone will hold the knowledge of the energy of the vacuum, and they will come to hold the very power of this planet through the mighty machine in the room, gesturing to the Hubble. The researchers are the key to making sure that happens, and they will not release them. I believe they do. Oh, fuck. Do they actually say non-male? Oh, fuck. Oh, let me see. I could have swore they said male, but maybe they didn't. Just a y young green dragon. Okay. Dra Jen, it does not matter. Although it does, it is interesting. Like, okay, so they're 70 years old. Where's, where's, uh, where's mama? Where's Mama? How did this dragon get here? Uh, let's see. There are cells, but there may or may not be people behind. Uh, the longer the conversation goes on, Isilius will be more irritable until they reach maximum anger. Uh, and when you hit that, Boom, young green dragon. Stats can be found associated with your chosen system. Lovely. I forgot how easy or hard a young green dragon is. I don't have... I have the books, but they're not in the library, and I should have grabbed them. I should have grabbed them. Or rather, they're in the library. I'm not in the library. I'm in the garden right now. It's like a false hydra. It's like a... It just sprouts. It just sprouts. The other option would be uh, someone saved the egg and it took a very long time to hatch or something like that or it was in stasis until recently. Like from before, bef the before times. Mm. Planeswalker has no sense of right and wrong. Mm. Uh, it must defend its horde. It will target spellcasters of the party first, perceiving them as the biggest threat because of how they draw on the energy around them. When the battle turns in the player's favor, Asilius may destroy some of the books in an attempt to still keep the knowledge for themselves. Uh, if the battle is too easy, Asilius can use an action to animate one book to attack each party member. Stats at GM discretion based on chosen system. Additionally, if the battle is going very poorly for the players, one of the researchers can escape from their bonds and cast a stun spell on Asilius, effective for one round. At least they have that, like a way to adjust. That is actually something that is normally done in AL Adventures. They will have, oh, how big is your party? Or like, no, not how big. It's part of how big and how, what level are they? They will have adjustments to groupings, like add one or two or three more uh, mooks or something like that into the fray. 
And here, the action economy against four to seven adventurers against the young green dragon. Uh, uh, one against that many is not great. The action economy. In shambles. A thousand gold pieces for winning. Dozens upon dozens of books on a wide variety of topics. Uh, most focus on the energy of the vacuum, back holes, and the study of other rogue planets. Uh, knowledge above gold. But he still had gold. Don't worry about that. Telescope's in pristine condition. All of the missing researchers. Uh, I do have to wonder if Eric is named after someone in real life. I feel like I should check the the credits and see. Uh, if any of the players did not survive the battle, Eric and the other researchers will express their condolences and gratitude, even promising to dedicate their research to the Fallen. An extremely high honor. Uh, yeah, versus four level sevens. But the question is, if they if they're level tens, or like if you have seven level tens, that's a much different story. Like there's a lot of wiggle room even in the tears. Ah. Uh. Okay. Uh, research, blah, blah, blah. We research, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? That's the entire reason we're here. They will continue to evaluate what exactly the energy of the vacuum is and how it could be used to help their society. Uh, once these conversations have been had, Eric will be able to cast a spell Asilius used to steal Hubble in order to return it to its proper place around Earth pinpointing as close to the time as it was taken as possible. Close enough that those on Earth would only notice a glitch in the data. Players. Being smart. Banish the thought. Banish the thought. <laughs> I say as I'm just thinking back, like, yeah, I've, I've made a lot of fucking missteps. <laughs> Personally, I just know some people get really, really unlucky. When the players have finished checking over the area and asking questions, they can make their way back to Aldestron. Um, they can get a rest. They could get a rest. Uh, uneventful, unharmed, deliver to the observatory. So they get thanked. Tea and pastries. Asilius' story. They were each visited by Asilius, who presented as a fellow researcher wanting to know what they were working on. As they told Asilius about their work, they had enticed them to make a journey to one of the other cities, each of them to somewhere else, telling them that there was a relevant new research there that they should take a look at. However, as soon as they got out of the city, Asilius took their true form and flew them to Moxana, where they were held captive, and Asilius questioned them, trying to get all the information they could about Hubble and how to make it functional and it, on, like, uh, ex Laris, ex Laris, ex Laris. Though the length of time they had spent with Asilius varied, they all had the same experience. Conclusion. Okay. And the rest is pictures. <laughs> when they talk about their dis situation, Eric will speak up. I'm terribly sorry for the turmoil this has put you through. We believed our only hope for both our worlds would be by bringing you here. Each of you, in your proper timeline, played a large role in Hubble's mission. I did my best to return it exactly when it was taken, hopefully restoring Earth to what it should be. We are eternally grateful for your help. I am without a doubt that both of our worlds will benefit. 
Whenever you're ready, I can send you home as well. The lives you were meant to live and all the benefits of this great telescope. Have time to say goodbye. Uh, if the players discuss staying on Alexaris instead of Earth, Sherry and Eric will encourage them to reconsider, but a persuasion check with an easy DC will convince them to let them stay, and they'll help them adapt to Exlaris as best they can, perhaps even with a job at the observatory. You can return back to the tavern uh, and bring the researchers and Sherry if they want to. Uh, so it's another persuasion check if they want to work for Failwin after this. Uh, so that's kind of a, yeah, go home or don't. I did hear that there's a, a thing in it about not going home. Well, like there, there is a bit more to the conclusion. But it's kind of a, I guess this could lead into more than a one shot. There's a lot to work with here in this world that they've built. Medium DC persuasion check to work for Failwin. Uh, invite them to come into her office without the rest of the party after spoken, speaking to the researchers. They become an information gatherer. They become a bartender. What I always dreamed of, being isekai and working as a bartender. Yes. Conclusion. <sighs> yeah, I've read that one. We've read that one. Being a vending machine... Uh, uh, uh. I don't want to have to level up my vending abilities. Don't make me level up my vending abilities. I don't even remember what the first thing he vends is, if it's water or not. I've read, I've read the book. I have the book. Actually, I might not have the book anymore. I may have tossed it. I may have tossed it. Unless I got a digital version? No, maybe not. You awake in the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Uh, but now you're outside of a building labeled Mission Operations. Maybe it is a sports drink. I felt like it was something incredibly basic. But it could be a sports drink because it's Japan. Players will retain that they have lived in a world without Hubble. And they don't recognize the differences to their actual reality. And they also remember the adventures they had on Exlaris as they worked to restore this timeline. If any of the players choose to remain on Exlaris, the individual that wakes up in Greenbelt is the character they created that is from Exlaris. <laughs> Sorry, I'm looking at the Yukikaze and like Space Battleship Himato, and it's kind of an eh? Eh? But then again, when I think of Yukikaze, it's kind of a wait. Are you, are you talking about the, like, 2000s in this anime? It's kind of, it's not that right. That's a, wait, no, that's Koikaze. Never mind, that's Koikaze, my bad. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, conclusion. It's, welcome, Azure. Uh, the Isekai story, the, 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 the adventure itself is really basic. And now that I look at it, it's kind of like there's literally two puzzles. There's literally two puzzles and like one, f I guess two encounters. Two possible encounters, but you don't have to encounter one. Uh, yeah, it's it's meant to be read. It's not really meant to be played. Yeah, three to four hours. I imagine a lot of that is like, again, telling the players. Well, maybe I shouldn't say telling the players, but like, we have a half hour to RP before we have to hit the next spot. You can one shot it. Three to four hours is a one shot ish time, I feel like. But yeah, the fact that um, if you don't come back to inhabit your body, the character that you created is now on Earth. So, again, an isekai. Everyone just gets isekai'd. Um, I'm not wilting. I I just haven't had water in a while. 
honestly. <clears throat> that's not that's my fault because I didn't take a break. So go get it. I could drink a little bit of mangonata though. Mango Nada was not meant to be drunk warm. Um, there's a little bit of regret in here. Yeah, a little bit of regret. <laughs> um, I guess it's room temperature, but still, considering it started as like a mango sorbet mixed with mango chunks and probably a lot of ice. Uh, mango nada. I will type it. I actually still have the picture up on something. Um, yeah, J. Bush has it. It's it's a tasty drink. It was it was it still kind of is tasty, but like it would it would do well from being cold. Because they can't say D and Z, but they're also pitting you against a, green, a young green dragon. So, still want to give you an idea, even if they can't say the name D and Z or the word, the the letters, letter number combo five E. Ah. Uh. Use the following text. The GM can incorporate their knowledge of the players in order to choose how each of them are tied to Hubble. It could be a scientist, researcher, mission controller, communicator, engineers, or astronaut who participated in a Hubble servicing mission. Or they could be a citizen scientist who uses Hubble's open data to conduct research and make discoveries. See? This is... This is edu educational. This is educational. I initially read that as Discovery in Dragon's Kappa. Like, Dragon's Kappa was all one thing. <laughs> um, for the drink? For the mangonada? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's tasty. I'm not one for, like, a huge amount of spice, but it's got a tempered level. <laughs> it's got a tempered level. Maybe if I drink enough mangonadas, I can like power up and be able to handle something a little spicier. Wordlessly, you all decide to walk inside the building. You go down a long hallway until you reach a lobby area with a large model of the Hubble Space Telescope. On the walls, you see photos of astronauts servicing the telescope and of a beautiful star forming region known as the Pillars of Creation. A sign proclaims that there have been over three decades of discovery and counting. You keep exploring and go down a hallway lined with breathtaking images of the cosmos. You recognize each one. Some show planets in your solar system, while others peer billions of light years away to capture gorgeous galaxies. At the end of the hallway, you find Hubble's operations control center. Rows of monitors and a whole team of engineers are dedicated to tracking and pointing Hubble, allowing the observatory to continue making important breakthroughs in astronomy. Look, look, some things are really expensive. Like, surprisingly expensive. Also, I guess government contracts. The more you look, the more you all look around, the more memories start clicking into place. You all excitedly share these facts with each other. You now remember that there are billions and billions of galaxies beyond our own, thanks to Hubble's deep field observations. You know that there are countless planets that orbit stars beyond our sun. You understand that dark matter and dark energy make up most of our universe, even if we don't fully understand how it works yet. In design hard. Plus, you realize with relief that even more missions are in operation that were made possible by Hubble's legacy. The James Webb Space Telescope is now in operations too, observing deeper into the infrared region of light. Soon, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope will make incredible observations that will continue to develop our understanding of the cosmos. Even spacewalking is more advanced, thanks to Hubble's servicing missions, and is completed often by astronauts staying in the International Space Station. Thank you for all our Dr. Inc. music. 
Earth utilizes technology that was originally developed for Hubble in order to help identify signs of cancer, improve computer chips, decipher ancient manuscripts, track endangered species, and more. You all grin at each other. Part of the reason why all this seems so familiar is because each of you have used Hubble to complete your own research about our universe, advancing our understanding of the cosmos and our place within it. Even better, all that data is made available to the public, so everyone's understanding can be improved and furthered. More discovery awaits, thanks to Hubble, and so your new friends on Oxlaris, who helps return it to our timeline. So yeah, I think it's also to help emphasize like you guys can do you you can all this stuff that we've been doing is yours as well this is humanity's achievement this is humanity's achievement together this looks really cool like this is a nice little end cap too i didn't realize it was hollow <laughs> i feel bad for saying that the power is yours this is about this is nasa nasa put out an rpg to entice people to learn about nasa and the Hubble space, the importance of the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, it's a it's a promotional piece that it's it's an RPG module that you can use to play with your favorite tabletop game, aka Dungeons and Dragons, probably. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's an adventure that you can run, uh, and you can kind of tie it into D and Z, or you can tie it into Sword World. Or, uh, shit, what were, I say, what were we reading? Last year I was reading, uh, Worlds Without Number? No, 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 no. Dungeon World. You can tie it into Dungeon World because there's dragons in there too, but there's not young green dragon, but I'm sure you can modify it. Yeah. You're not playing as telescopes now. You're playing as, they have an entire intro time dedicated to describing, like, a rogue planet, a literal rogue planet, uh, and how the population there survives. And there's a green dragon that finds out about the Hubble Space Telescope thanks to these, the, the natives, the other natives of the planet, the other humans, or rather the, the humanoid races of this planet have been basically spying on the Hubble to try and advance their own technology. Uh, I'm trying, th there's a way to phrase this. Like, so when you do like parentheses, like, Beneficiary, uh, good. Like they're not like derogatory. They they are actually spying to help advance their own science, and they're not doing it in like a bad way. Uh, and a green dragon decides, "Fuck you guys! I want this magic for myself. I want this Hubble space. I want this Hubble space telescope for myself." So a dragon decides to steal it, and the entire purpose of this is for you, human Earthling, to fetch this back. But also you get the, the cool the cool magic casting buff wielding body of a normal D and D adventurer, so But we we did need it. We did need it is the concept. The problem is when the dragon took it, it erased all all history that was associated with it. Oh, um I can link you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's explained in the beginning part. Uh, basically, this is a promo piece to try and like show the importance of the Hubble Space Telescope. Even if it's no longer necessary, like this is kind of a, a dedication piece to it. Uh, and also a reminder that, like, again, this is a great achievement for humanity. Anyone can uh, partake of the fruits of the labor of humanity. So that's just an illustration of the Roman Space Telescope. Ah. So this is the bullet, uh, bullet cluster. Huh. Looks pretty. And then they have the whole thing about like energy. Oh God. And how they tie in magic into science. This reminds me of, okay, this is, you know what? You know what? The person who 
started this, saw Stranger Things. Because I'm thinking about that whole might, the, the, the might theory that they have in Stranger Things season one. So it's kind of a, how can we, how can I use D&D concepts a bit or like modify it a bit to like teach my kids or get my kids interested in my job? And this is kind of part of what came out of it. I only saw uh, season one and part of season two, so that's all the comparison I can make. And the whole thing about dark energy. And how visible matter is 5%, dark matter is 27, and dark energy is 68. Oh god, this is just this is like oh, this is actual science stuff. <laughs> um it, it's it's kind of a weird one shot. The dragon did not erase the scientists that worked on it. It just erased the the object itself and related um it, stuff. Like the people who worked on it beforehand are not affected. Or rather, they don't remember it. It's explained in the opening area. Thank you for the stretch. Mm. Tiny, whiny, little shit. Mm. Mm. Okay. So I read the first part earlier. <laughs> I've been up for a long time today. I woke up really early. I'm probably going to go to bed early too, relatively speaking. When it comes to dark energy, more is unknown than known. We know how much dark energy there is because we know how it affects the universe's expansion. Other than that, it's a complete mystery, but is an important mystery. It turns out that roughly 68% of the universe is dark energy. Dark matter makes up about 27%. The rest, everything on Earth, everything ever observed with all our instruments, all normal matter, adds up to less than 5% of the universe. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's five. Oh god, it's almost two. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I started r really late today. I'm sorry. Really. Look, I had to, look, I had a little bit of introspection after Ava, okay? <laughs> a little bit of introspection after Ava. Uh. Yeah. It was like a blast from the past. One explanation for dark energy is that it is a property of space. Albert Einstein was the first person to realize that empty space isn't nothingness but instead is something with properties of its own. He discovered that additional space can come into existence and reasoned that empty space can possess its own energy, aka vacuum energy. Because this energy is a property of space itself, it wouldn't weaken as space expands. As more space comes into existence, additional energy of space would appear. As a result, the universe would expand faster and faster. Another explanation for how space acquires energy comes from the quantum theory of matter. In this theory, empty space is actually full of temporary virtual particles that continually form and then disappear. When physicists, physicists try to calculate how much energy this would give empty space, the answer came out wrong. Wrong by a lot. The number came out 10 to the power of 120 times too big. That's a one with 120 zeros after it. Ah, that many times too big. It's quite big. Yet another potential explanation for dark energy speculates that as a new kind of dynamical energy fluid or field, something that fills all of space but has an effect on the expansion of the universe that is opposite of the effect that matter and normal energy have. Some theorists have named this quintessence, 
after the fifth element of the Greek philosophers. But if quintessence is the answer, we still don't know what it is like, what it interacts with, or why it exists. A last possibility is that Einstein's theory of gravity is incorrect, or there is something he overlooked. This view of dark energy may require a new theory of gravity, or a modification of it. Any changes would affect our ideas of the expansion of the universe, as well as our understanding of how normal matter behaves. By studying how clusters of galaxies form, we could discover if the solution to the dark energy problem is a new theory of gravity or not. If we do need a new theory, how could it correctly describe the motion of objects in our solar system, as Einstein's theory already does, while giving away, or while giving us a way to describe dark energy's role in the universe? There are candidate theories, but none are compelling. So the mystery continues. What we need to resolve, or what we need to resolve the dark energy puzzle. A property of space, a new dynamic fluid, or a new theory of gravity is more data. <laughs> uh, pulled out for gravity rush, huh? This man, science is wonderful, but also boggling. I I feel like at once it's kind of a, this is miraculous, but at the same time it's kind of a, does it affect anything? And the answer is it affects everything, but also affects nothing, doesn't it? Science is difficult. What is that? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Mind boggling effects. Yes, exactly, Jay. That, yeah. The PlayStation 2 can produce mind-boggling effects. <laughs> the universe can make mind-boggling effects. It made it made it made me. It made you. <laughs> Gravitational lensing, we learned about that. The Einstein ring. Uh, the shifting of lights. Oh, right, the images. So this is the end of the Hubble Control Center area. Oh, you could do... Oh, this is cool. Um, Give me a second. And then the pioneers. Hold on, let me copy this. Is there anything else? With... Okay, then... The... Oh, God. They have it on Flickr? They have it on Flickr. So I'm, I remember looking through this and very initially when it came out and thinking, oh, uh, I really hope it was kind of like a, I, I hope that there is something to do with more detail with this, but also at the same time I don't because damn, I don't have the mental capacity to think about this right now. And now I'm disappointed that like, oh, we just get shown like what it looks like, the schematic for the model. We don't get a puzzle based on this. But at the same time, that's a lot of energy to put into it. But they're also NASA, so they could put they could afford to put some thought into it. Uh well, this is also good for those of you who are making sci-fi stuff. <laughs> you could actually you could you could just rip stuff from fucking NASA. What are your players gonna know? And we have the map, we have the appendix, and the credits. Okay, that threw me for a loop because the adventure design is Christina Mitchell and the graphic design being from Michelle Belleville. Uh, development and editing, huh? Uh, okay, so there is no one, no one named Eric. That was the one thing that was kind of a, is this based on someone real? Actually, hold on. Nope. Yeah, or if you want to do some like weird spell jammery stuff, I guess maybe if you want like a, a intro to spell jammer, I guess without your players maybe realizing <laughs> maybe they don't have to return to Earth. Uh, 
again, it kind of depends on uh, what the what the jobs of the people who are in charge of this are actually. If they might be like public public relations y type people. So what is what is this? Not all nerds are into D and Z. And God, I hope that they're not all playing D and Z. <laughs> Ow! Uh, oh, I forgot to turn the out. I forgot to turn that one off. I forgot to turn that one off. You would hope that maybe one of them is playing. You know, out. Oh, oh, okay. Maybe ah ah. Okay, fine, fine. Maybe they're playing out Lancer or something. <sighs> Maybe they're playing Lancer or something. <laughs> so this is the 360, huh? It does kind of hurt. Thank you for the water. I'm going to drink some more manganata. The manganata hurts more. Also, thank you, Crane, for the follow. <laughs> yep. That mango nada. So this is a YouTube watch along? Or like a YouTube thing? Oh, hold on. And this is the new one that they were talking about. Feedback survey. What's the... Sorry, there, there, was, there was cooler photos. God, give, give me photo, photo library. I guess if you guys want a... Uh, Want new wallpapers and you like stars? Uh, latest 2024 images, huh? Oh god, it's Flickr. Look at this. Go ahead. Look. Now is a good time to be a space VTuber, isn't it? Look at, look at this. I'm not, I can't even show you the whole thing because I cut it off and I have to adjust for that. Oh god, this is huge. But of course it would be. Space VTuber? You should know. Oh! Oh, is that Anzi? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, look, NASA is asking you to take these photos away. Share, share, the, share the beauty of the universe. Share the beauty of the universe. If only NASA studied plants, damn it. <laughs> uh, actually, there's probably something I could, probably a similar kind of, I shouldn't say similar agency, but there probably is something I could do for that. This one with the like cut through looks neat too. But as far as I know, these all are what? Like, these are released to public domain, aren't they? Based on their very nature. I'm trying to remember. I know a lot of things that the government produces are public dome. I shouldn't say government produces. Um, like when, when military marching bands make do performances, uh, recordings of that, uh, that are produced by the government, I believe become public domain, which is kind of neat. Let's see. Some rights reserved. What are the rights? Uh, let's see. You can. Sh you have to attribute. Indicate if changes are made. Basically, pretty pretty decent. Pretty decent. I credit NASA. <laughs> Just credit NASA. I mean that that's what it is. God, this looks 
The stars, the way the stars look. Almost fake. But that is just the nature of lighting, I'm sure. That's true, too. You can't just take a single image. They are taken from web, actually. I'm looking at the web images because... Not, not the other one, because I want to see the latest and greatest. Goldman, I am, this is not Hubble. This is not Hubble. I am lying to you right now. This is not Hubble. Uh, because Hubble was a different set. Um, let me see. Missions. Yeah. Hubble's worse. Uh, where do they have the images? Or rather, shit, I'm not even supposed to be looking at that exactly. I'm supposed to be looking at Hubble, Hubble. Akatsuki? Okay, Akatsuki. Akatsuki, then. I should probably be looking at two. Maybe three. Uh, F, G, H. Look, it's got to be coming up soon, right? I. Hubble. You told me... Hubble! There we go. Give me images, give me images. Where's where's the images? Oh wait, whoa, 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 this one looks a bit like something I saw earlier today. God, how big is this? It looks cool. But it is lower quality. So does Hubble do more four-pointed and Webb does six? Well, I guess like at six, but then there's kind of like some smaller one, like the smaller one through there. So it's how the stars are, are depicted. I say depicted. Mm -hmm. Because of the way that the telescope is. Because of the way it was built. But still. It is it's lower quality, but at the same time, it's still cool. It's still a monument to human achievement. This was a good thing today. I was thinking, like, maybe I should... when I, After seeing Ava, it's kind of like, maybe I should sue an Ava, Ava talk or something. But I think this was also is good. And I also think this thematically kind of fits for the ends of my my thinking today. I'm, not, I'm no longer going to be thinking after this stream. I'm going to be doing... I'm getting petting cat. <laughs> Full Ava merch. I was looking at that the other day. <laughs> a, a little bit, a little bit. Uh, yeah, actually. So, it's still ongoing. Today. Today and Wednesday. And maybe Monday. Maybe tomorrow. Uh, they are doing showings of End of Evangelion in theaters. It is It is subtitled. Uh, I watched it today, and I believe that it might actually be the... It's it's not, like, remastered or anything, as far as I know. <laughs> because it didn't have anything about Studio Kara on it. Uh, but that might also... I don't I don't know. Um, why? Well, uh -huh. they got the license to it? <laughs> I'm not... I'm not looking at gift horse in the mouth. Or, like, gift depression horse in the mouth. Uh... Yeah, let's see, Evangelion. Uh, G Kids, G Kids got it. G Kids gets all sorts of stuff. So, um, yeah. This is the link. If you are interested in seeing Evangelion in theaters, I am not paid to say this. Um, I I paid money to see it instead. I paid I paid money to see it to get depressed. <laughs> Yeah, they've gotten a lot of stuff. Yeah, this this image um, reminds me a bit of that. Quite a bit, actually. 
Uh, the theater was actually kind of, it wasn't completely packed. Like the sides were empty, but the set, the sides were not empty, but the sides were emptier. Uh, but at least where I was, there was a couple dozen people interested. And who watched. And it was silent during some parts of that. Oh, no one walked out, as far as I know. <laughs> Have a good night, Angela. So this is a butterfly nebula. I can see why. Uh, ultraviolet, visible, and infra infrared observations. Uh, taken in 2019 and 2020. You can see more information about it if you go to hubblesite.org news 202031. Oh, I want to tell you that the average age of the people no, I am dis I'm discounting myself and the other people I was with. The average age in there was millennial. It was millennial. <laughs> I don't think there was a single person there who, who, um, was seeing it for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. There were some, there were some people who were younger and I'm sure some people who were older, but, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm very certain that everyone in there knew exactly what they were signing up for. Yeah. That's why I'm discounting myself. Okay. <laughs> and the people I was with, we, um, we be raising that number inhumanely, shall we say. Uh, but I think that's going to be it for this. I want to, I want to save this. I, I already had download, but I didn't actually download. I just, uh. Shinji is just, Shinji's a 14 year old boy. I used to have, I feel like every, Oh, not every decade since its release, but like close to every decade since its release, I've rewatched it and things change over time. Viewpoints change. Uh, and seeing how young a 14 year old boy is. And expectations that are placed upon people. Things change. Oh, let's see. Ah, I'm still on talking. Oh, right. <laughs> I'm still on talking. Kind of a wait. Why? Oh, that's why. Frick. I'm still here. Like, why isn't it changing? I'm still on talking. That's why. Okay. Ah, don't know. It's not going to be another impact. Also, it's not Shinji's fault. It is actually not Shinji, Shinji's fault. Uh, so, this week. This week. Upcoming. Uh, so the plan is going to be for Freerin tomorrow night at 7.30. Until 9.30ish? It's, it's not quite two hours. It is four episodes. But it's closer to the one and a half. Uh, if you're not familiar with Freerin... It is a show about an elf trying to retrace her steps through her old party's path to beat the Demon King with, with a new party in tow. It's a very good series. It's still airing. The, next, the last episode is coming out, I think, like this upcoming week. Wednesday, I'm going to be trying Skull Monkeys. Wednesday, I'm going to be trying Skull Monkeys because it is a, it is a sequel to... The Neverhood, which I just finished. So it's going to be the first, the first session of Skull Monkeys. I tested it enough to make sure that it initially worked. Uh, it's going to be my first time doing this manner. So hopefully there won't be too many bumps along the way. Uh -huh. And Friday is going to be another new game. Entirely new. Uh, it just came out two weeks ago or so, maybe? It came out very recently. That's Quilts and Cats of Calico. It's, it's a board game. I haven't actually played it yet, uh, but just got a release. And on Sunday at 5 o'clock, just like today was supposed to be, 
We're going to be going over the VTuber. <laughs> We're going to have a talk about the VTuber uh, trading card games that have been coming out. Because guess what? There's a third. There's a third entering the fray. Yeah. Uh, so so Shy Lily is releasing one. And looking, we're, we'll talk about it more on Sunday. The, uh, I'm not joking you. There's a third. There's Rift Runners, Oshi Push, and V Card. Also, this is if you're discounting Vice Schwartz, which is not limited to VTubers and was not primarily started for VTubers, but it does have Hollow Live in it, so it's got that going for it. <laughs> it's got the, the bit, one of the big companies, you know. So yeah, Sunday we'll be taking a look into that. Uh, I've got a tabletop sim of Riff Runners. Uh, I have... There's at least one VOD. Who knows if there's going to be a second VOD by the time uh, next Sunday rolls around for Oshi Push. And then there's been like, what, three cards released for V card? So I'll, I'll, I'll be gathering data for that before Sunday. But we can, we can look. We can look. <laughs> and check it out. Uh, and that is going to be the plan for the upcoming week. Actually, I just wanted to make sure, like, okay, 324th. Wait. Like, wait. 18th, 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 18th. Today, Monday's 18th. Uh, because it's no worse than like Vishojo. <laughs> Honestly. No worse than Vishojo. Not that she's associated with Vishojo, just more of a... <laughs> a virtual VTuber. Why not stick a V in front of everything? Also, of course, the funny, like, it's a V-card, of course. Uh, let's see. Who is on right now? Who's on right now? Um, <laughs> yeah, have a good night, Orange Cobra Man. Sleep well. Actually, is there anyone else in this category? I highly doubt it. Or are there any other VTubers in this category? Um, wait. Please, please say, please say I'm streaming under Dungeons and Dragons category and not like board games. Uh-huh. Hmm. Okay, I was. Because I'm looking at Dungeons and Dragons category and like there's, there's nothing in here. There's nothing in here in this category on live channels. What the fuck? Am I not live here? Am I not live in the... Wait. I'm not seeing anything except for like one... I'm seeing one thing. Maybe I'm looking in the wrong cat. Oh, it's doing Dungeons and Dragons, the animated series. What the fuck? Okay. Okay. That's why. That's why. I, it automatic when I searched, it searched for Dungeons and Dragons, the animated series. So that's why I was seeing nothing except for one stream that was not in English. That's so strange. Okay. Who's this person? Uh, do you guys want to jump into someone's CNC campaign? Or. Wait. No, no, I won't do that one. Uh, it was kind of, oh, this seems fun, but what do we even raid with? <laughs> I, uh. I suppose, I mean, you don't have to have a raid message. There doesn't have to be a raid message, because the only other raid message I could come up with is something about, oh god, um, <laughs> stunned by humanity, basically. Ah. Uh, I'm, I'm in a more introspective mood than normal. Yeah, Isekai by NASA. NASA, NASA. I keep saying NASA. It's not NASA, it's NASA, isn't it? Nah, nah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Who else? It's a VTuber stream, at least. It is. It is. It is. 
Um, otherwise, actually, we could go to Ronin instead. She's playing Diablo. Ronin's always a good time. And she's gonna be, you know, she's she's six hours in, but it's kind of a, she's gonna be up for another, like, two hours, right? Minimum. She's gonna be totally up for another two hours minimum. Yeah, green woman. Okay, we're going, or green woman support, go in. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, does Ronan does Ronan actually know what an isekai is? I cannot guarantee you that Ronan knows what isekai means. I would hope she knows what isekai means, but we, yeah, yeah. She, okay. Jay, Jay says yes. She's she knows. Okay, good. That might be something that she's already learned. Excellent. But she she started streaming without knowing what an isekai is. Okay. Okay. Ronan, Ronan, one day. One day there will be an education. You guys are going to teach her. teach her. Teach her well. Have fun with Ronan. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining uh, today. Uh, sorry for being like four hours late. Um, it will absolutely happen again in the future. I'm sorry. Hopefully not this upcoming week. I'm not planning on being late. I don't have any other big plans. I don't have any other movies to go see, although I should check on the Bunny Girl thing. Bunny Girl, uh, Rascal Does Not Dream, is also going to be in theaters coming up soon. Hello, Abigail. Thank you. <laughs> if you're interested in Rascal Does Not Dream, uh, I know there was talking to Discord about uh, that being that being shown. It's so terrible. Yeah, yeah I, guess, I guess that is a word. That is a word for me. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining and have fun with running. <laughs>